Okay, we're on the air. Madam President, we're on the air. <clears throat> Do I have to bang this? Yes. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Please silence your cell phones and place a lid on all your drinks. Okay. Summer has arrived, and with it, more sunshine. I see acts of kindness played forward in this community every day and want to acknowledge and thank those folks. The GRF motto is neighbor helping neighbor. Now for a presentation from the Laguna Woods Men's Golf Club, President Johnson. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. Sorry. All right. Okay, I call the meeting to order. Um, we have established a quorum. All right, now the Pledge of Allegiance. I'm sorry, this is a rookie mistake, but I will, uh, Diane, please lead us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, I'd like to acknowledge the media. They're present, thank you. Approval of the agenda. Um, all right, I'll second. Okay, all those in favor? Okay, it's unanimous, thank you. All right, now approval for the minutes of the meeting. I'm gonna do it. I voted against the agenda. Okay. I apologize. Thank you. Cheryl, did you get that? Okay, now for the approval of the minutes. If she's voting against, is there a reason that we should not? Okay, Pat, what is your reason for voting against the agenda? Because there's nothing in this open meeting. There's nothing in this open meeting regarding the bylaws. Okay. I believe that it should have been in an open meeting, the one we had last, last month. Okay, it's not, uh, it's going to be continued in the closed meeting and so it'll make the August meeting, if it makes the August meeting. Open meeting in August. Oh, open meeting in August. Okay. All right, I don't know if you saw that, but it's in the closed. You're welcome. Okay, approval of the minutes of the meeting. We're going to take them one at a time. So the June 4th regular open meeting session. I hear Diane make motion to approve, a second. Okay, Dick Palmer. All those in favor? All right, so Pat, you're not? No. Did you have an addition or correction? Pat, do you have an addition or correction? No. You're just opposed to the minutes? Uh, I'm opposed to it, again, because it's the same thing about this uh, bylaw thing. All right, thank you. Are we voting on screen? No, we're voting on hands. Do you want us to vote on screen, Cheryl? We do have it turned on. It would help be helpful if you could vote on the Of course, screen. then that's what we'll do then. All right, so now do you want us to go back and vote for the June 4th one? Okay, we'll start with the June 10th special open meeting for the 2020 fee review. May I have a motion for all those that approve it? All right, Jim, thank you. A second, Bert. All right, let's have a vote on the screen. Approval of the minutes. It's not coming up there yet. No. I know. It's coming up. All you got to do is click on the arrow. So now approved of minutes. Okay. I'll approve those. Okay. Here. That's weird. Right on the yes or the no. Do you have a thing? I don't see anything. Oh. Should we take it? No, he doesn't have, uh, let's see if he raises it. Jim is voting yes, Cheryl. He, his uh, stylus isn't working. All right, thank you. <clears throat> 
June All right. 10th. All right, next we're going to vote on approval of the minutes of the meeting of June the 10th, the special meeting for the 2020 CIP review. We're doing it online. We don't need a motion if you, okay. If there's, either make a motion or, or get unanimous consent. Okay, may I have a motion then please? I did it. Okay, you made a motion. All right. I seconded it. Joan seconded it. All right, now we just have to vote. Now I can't get back. All right. <clears throat> okay, now it's time for report of the chair. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. As basically, summer's arrived, the days are longer more sunshine, and I do see acts of kindness being played forward in this community every day. And I want to acknowledge and thank those folks. The GRF motto is neighbors helping neighbors. And now we're gonna have a presentation from the Laguna Woods Men's Golf Club's president, John Soul, to the foundation. Would everybody who's involved please stand up and come to the, to the center? I go to right. I'm going to pass this over to Bob Napak to say a few words, and then Marcy will speak. Good morning, everybody. Uh, as you probably know, we had our memorial tournament last month, and the basis for the tournament, the bottom line, is to raise money for the foundation, which we did. It's also to have a great time. Uh, everybody had a great time out there, um, playing golf, having dinner. Uh, and raising money. So uh, there are a lot of people that helped put this together. And I'd just like to take a minute, if you don't mind, to thank them. We, this was the third year that we've co-sponsored with VMS on this. Uh, and they were invaluable in helping us. Um, Brian Gruner from the Department of Recreation, uh, the Director of Recreation, Jackie Comfort, Becky Jackson, Tom McRae and his whole crew were invaluable in helping us put a tournament of this size together over there. And Sean Sincata did a great job with the course. It was in excellent shape. Uh, from the men's club, of course, John Sewell, our president. Um, David Schmidley, who got all our sponsors together. Uh, and that's where the large part of this money, the, the goal was to have the tournament pay for itself. The sponsor money goes directly to the foundation, and that's exactly what we were able to do. Uh, Paul Santoro, um, Ron Kula, David Lilliquist, Dennis Boudreau, Sam Murad, Ron Gordon, our treasurer, um, Annette Sewell, Judy Murad, Lorraine uh, Talafag... Tal Taglia Ferry, sorry, I always, I always trip on that name, and her crew of ladies who were invaluable in checking everybody in and making this happen. Um, and myself, I, we, all, <laughs> we all did a great job, so thank you very much. Um, at this time, we'd like to present the foundation with a check for $35,500. <laughs> On behalf of the foundation and the residents that you help, thank you, thank you, thank you. You have no idea how far this money goes in helping residents in need. You provide care services, ambulance services, medical alerts, pharmacy care, doctor co-pays, and food, our basic requirement. Our motto is that no resident should ever have to choose between buying food and paying for drugs, or medication, not drugs. <laughs> <laughs> but on behalf of the foundation, thank you. You are really our superstars. Let's move over. Behind the check. Snuggly. We're going to get snuggly. Can you get us all? Yes, thank you. We'll have 
Thank you. Thanks, Becky. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. I know that probably uh, Jeff or Chauvin will be talking about the uh, annual fun, free Independence Day celebration this Thursday, July 4th at Clubhouse 2 from 4 to 9 p.m. So right now we'll have an update from VMS. Today's VMS director and chair, Dr. Lisa Bender, will be making the report. Thank you. Yeah, I'm here. I'm not president. <laughs> okay. All right. So today, um, as an update to GRF, I want to talk about a publication that many of you never, ever get to see. You know that we have many fine communication vehicles within the village. We have a wonderful uh, department headed by Eileen. I can't turn around to see if she's still there. Eileen? She's there. She's there. Okay, good. Um, so, um, the, so what I want to talk about is the employee newsletter. The employee newsletter is emailed monthly to all VMS staff. It's also printed and distributed to employees that don't have access to uh, an electronic um, email address here. And um, I find it pretty good house organ, you know? And I'm always impressed, I'm always glad to receive it um, as we do in VMS. And so I just want to highlight a few things that go on in this employee newsletter. Okay, well first, it honors the work that VMS employees are doing for some of the more successful village projects and events. So it, um, in this case, it highlighted, um, excuse me, uh, uh, the Memorial Day celebration activities, the golf tourney and dinner, and as you heard from uh, the golf club, that many of the VMS employees were absolutely instrumental in making that happen. And so this is the way to really highlight back to other employees who might not be involved in those events or know what's going on in the village because they got their heads down answering resident calls and things like that, to know how their fellow colleagues are contributing here to life in the village. Now, this next one is my favorite. Ten powerful steps to diffuse angry customers. Do you think we have angry residents at some point? Do you think we have angry board members? Okay, I let, I let it rip at a plan arrive about three weeks ago when I needed them to do to help recover from my kind of surgery. And I guess I just didn't understand all the rules associated with it. I thought it was like, okay, come get me you know, at the 2.15 at my house and take me, you know, kind of someplace because I have this medical thing going on. And she said, no, 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 that's not the way it works. And I went, ah, ah, ah. I was really pretty nasty, actually. I hate to admit it. But the person on the other end of the phone kept his cool, handled me in an appropriate customer service way. So I was able to apologize by providing a kudos to that employee, okay? So if any of you just kind of can observe or don't have stories for you to tell about how you have been angry with some of our employees, um, let it be known that customer service is an important part of any employee's uh, duty here. And this is part of the training that they, that they get. And if anybody would um, 
like to know the tricks of the tray, this is uh, back there. Um, or I'll give you one. I had to read it several times to know how to diffuse my stuff. <laughs> Okay, here's another um, sort of training, I, I believe, that happens during this, uh, this, in this employee newsletter. This, this section is around how to communicate with people with hearing loss. You know, it's very important when we hire people here into the community that they know that they're dealing with uh, an elderly population that, um, could um, have different kinds of disabilities that they'd be expected to work with, handle, and uh, uh, treat with respect and kindness. So again, this is um, uh, some training for folks on how to deal with people who might have some hearing loss. OK, uh, the next one. I love this one. Encourage coworkers to respond to your email. So let them know you need a response. I was the person when I actually worked, and still now, I still have 10,000 emails sitting in my, my inbox. I try to flag them if I need to send a response or something like that. Um, and so this is um, a way in which to encourage people to uh, let other people know. So you can say something like that. I'm not sure I, I, I've heard from you about my inquiry. What is that? You know, tell me about it. Okay, how to handle a coworker's apology. Again, this is a people environment, and things are going to go awry, and interpersonal relationships are going to be just like ours here, right? How many of you have not ever had to apologize? somebody, right? Well, in this workplace, they encourage people to apologize, but they also encourage people to accept the apology and not let the incident go, oh, okay. And not let the incident go unaddressed. And the last one is, is oh, excuse me, go back one, Cheryl, is encouraging people to get on the bus, and there were docent tours for employees so they could see the total context of where they're working. And I think that's, imp that's important, that you not just know your box, but you get to see the entire box so you know how that you're contributing to the community. And lastly, on this piece, there is um, kudos for a job well done. So everybody knows about the kudos cards, which are out at the front here in the community center. If an employee has done something for you that you find of merit, you can write a kudos, and it gets written up. It's told to the supervisor. <coughs> it also gets written up inside the employee newsletter so that employees can see um, what their fellow workers are doing to um, enjoy some of these kudos, okay? And here it was from customer service reps to landscaping to uh, public relations um, <coughs> and uh, Pamela Bashline got one this last time around. So that's really nice to see. The other thing that's also included in this is Who's new to the community? An opportunity to welcome any employee that's been hired during that period of time. It also shows who's been promoted. So this is a really a very good feel-good um, document for employees about their work and their lives here. So I just wanted to demonstrate that. And is there anything else coming? Is that it? That's it. Oh, okay. All right. So I would be a mess if I didn't also tell you about we have a great communications and marketing department. Many of these things you've seen are flyers, posters, the video monitor uh, slides that, um, that
that are there, and these are all to engage our residents and let them know what's going on. And this has been tremendously different in the number of years that I've been here, about five. Okay, the last two years or so. Eileen, how long have you been here? Eileen? Wow. The 18 months, the number of publications, the places that they are, the graphics associated with it. Um, and it's just kind of quite, quite amazing. Next, Cheryl. And the number of newsletters um, that go around, um, and they're printed and distributed throughout the village. And the last one is our village brochures and special projects. Um, so it's the trees in the village, what's happening in social services, the new special project about uh, centenarians. And um, they just do a terrific and marvelous job. And I just wanted to show you today that they also do that for our own employees. And with that, thank you very much for your time and attention. And anybody at home, please come out. We have so much fun on these boards. Yes. Right? right? So yes. we, we would like you to join us. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, now we will have the uh, C re next we'll have the CEO report. Jeff? Madam Chair, a um, couple of things I wanted to mention. Um, summer's here, as you indicated. Um, just want to um, advise people and recommend to uh, remain hydrated out there and drink a lot of water when you're out in our vents that we have going on in the village. Um, Keep outdoor activities um, short and sweet um, so you don't get overheated from the sun. Um, check the forecast when you go out there and make sure that you're aware of how um, hot it's going to be. Um, sometimes we can hit peak um, degrees of over 100 degrees, and um, that, that obviously is something to be concerned about. Obviously, um, wear your sunscreen, have it handy, um, and um, wear loose-fitting clothing, light fabrics um, that'll help uh, keep you cool and for those that have pets don't forget pet care make sure they they have their water and are in comfortable environments to do that and as we move into that summer and you're prepared as we just indicated um, coming up on Thursday we want you to all come and celebrate our 4th of July in the village activities um, I'm going to enjoy fun free Independence Day extravaganza at Clubhouse 2 uh, as indicated, from 4 o'clock to 9 p.m. We'll have a DJ um, performing there. Um, Pickle, um, Pickleback Shine performs at 6.15. Uh, the Mad Platters perform at 4. Um, fireworks will start at 8.45 p.m., or once it's dark enough, obviously, that the work. The event offers a kids' fun zone. Uh, the Village Cent Centenarian Project will be on display. Um, and if you haven't seen that, you've got to come out and see these wonderful photos and the individuals that were part of that project. Um, and that'll be um, displayed um, whereby Pool 2 will be open um, to all ages from 4 to 7 p.m. We'll have food, ice cream, kettle corn, beer, and wine will be available for purchase. Gate opens at 4 p.m. Um, gate 12 will be used for unloading only beginning at 4 p.m. Early arrival and setup was not permitted. Shuttle service will run from Clubhouse 7 um, and the community center to Clubhouse 2. And carpooling is recommended, obviously, for parking issues. Sitting is not provided, so bring your blankets and lawn chairs. Um, uh, that'll make it life a lot easier. Uh, glass bottles and containers and dogs and pets are prohibited. This is sponsored in part by Edna and the Saddleback Emeritus Program. Um, also, uh, and if you need any additional information about the 4th, um, you can call 949-268-2417. That's 949-268-2417 or 949-597-4286. Or you can email recreation at bmsinc.org. Also wanted to mention relative to Independence Day holiday um, on, on the 4th, a um, number of the offices will be closed, so the business center, recreation departments, um, PC Learning Center, PC Workshop, and the MAC Learning Center will be closed. 
Uh, the community fitness center and table tennis rooms will be open from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, clubhouse reservations, library, and emeritus classes will be closed. Relative to the clubhouses, Clubhouse 1 will be open from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. Clubhouse 2 from 4 to 10 p.m. Performing Arts Center from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. Clubhouses 4, 5, and 6 will be closed and Clubhouse 7 will be open from 8 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. Um, so I think, and, oh, the bigger, big one on um, the aquatics, Pool 1 will be open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Pool 2 from 7 a.m. to 1 p.m. and then be closed and then from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. And then Pool 4 from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. Pool 5 from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m and pool six from noon to 6 p.m. And so we want to encourage everybody to come out for the 4th of July and have a lot of fun and uh, look forward to seeing you there. That's my report from today. All right, thank you. All right, now it is our time to have open forum for anyone to come up who would like to discuss something that is not on the agenda. If you'd like to speak to something that pertains to an item on the agenda, then you're just going to have to wait till that comes up. Okay? Cheryl, who do we have to start with? Our first speaker is Chris Collins. Okay, and I just want to remind, remind everyone that it's a three-minute max. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Chris Collins, 3306Q, and I'm here um, representing the Foundation of Laguna Woods Village. I want to give you a little more of an update. We've had a magnificent update today with the Men's Golf Club being here and their magnanimous contribution to the foundation. And so it's um, fitting that I just tell you a little bit about what some residents that have been, um, that have enjoyed the largesse of, of help from the foundation. So um, here's what some village residents have, have said. In these hard times, when anyone can be facing financial difficulty, it's comforting to know that the foundation of Laguna Woods Village is devoted to some level of relief for those in crisis. Um, here's another one. Thank you so much for the gift cards at Staters and taxi vouchers. This has been a rough year, but I've been blessed with many angels helping me out. Another one. We wouldn't have made it without your heartfelt generosity and compassion. There are some additional thank you notes that the Foundation of Laguna Woods Village has received, underscoring the importance of donations that the Foundation received in response to its recent spring appeal here in the village. Foundation wants to thank all of those residents who sent uh, donations because you have made the Foundation's motto, which is, Neighbors Helping Neighbors, a reality. With those donations, the Foundation is able to continue um, its primary mission of providing temporary financial assistance to residents who need, with needs for medical care, as uh, Marcy said, uh, pharmacy costs, caregiver services, grocery cards, taxi vouchers, dental care, and other related needs. All requests are always vetted through the social services and kept anonymous. Donations also permit social services to provide residents with financial needs with medical alerts, care, ambulance contracts, and earthquake kits. With the village's continued support, the foundation also continues to fund Meals on Wheels um, in the village, uh, feeding between 150 and 175 uh, residents monthly. Um, it's also been able to provide needed equipment for needy low vision residents through the services of Braille Institute, as well as provide scholarships for uh, day services for residents with dementia and Alzheimer's. The foundation also transports residents to the South County Outreach Food Pantry. So for more information about any of these programs, please contact Social Services at 949-597-4267, or you can contact the foundation at 949-268-2246, or online, the foundation at comline.com. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Okay, our next speaker is Buckley Mid. Did I? Buckley and Park. Okay. Miss Kate Park, 
4008-2D, in Buckley, same address, 2F. We're here today as residents and also golfers. What we're concerned with, we went back and looked at your operation statements for 16, 17, 18, and year to date. What we saw in 16, you generated for golf $1,441,000. In 17, you generated $1,423,000. That's a loss of approximately 2%. Your actions, because of that, and other actions, you elected to increase the fees by 45%. So if I look at your budget, or what your revenue, 1,423, and multiply that by 45%, you should have generated, in golf revenue, approximately $2,069,000. However, your actual numbers from your statement says you only generate one million. 757,000. That's approximately 17.5%. You're on the wrong trend. For eight, for 19, the last numbers I saw was from a presentation showed April's numbers. We were down 106, you were down approximately 161,000. I tried to figure out how that was to a budget. So I took your actual revenues. You always talked about a 4% Inflation rate, I multiply that for. So I came up with a budget for four months of 621000 but you still have a loss of 35%. So then SK and I and other members said, what can we do about this? Well, our decision was that you got to look at revenues, cost, and utility. You looked at some of those. For utilities, the golf course is used probably 80 to 100% between 7 and, 11, 7 and 12 from 12 to 2, you probably decline somewhere between 20 and 30 percent. At 2 o'clock, you have over 50 percent decline. Our recommendation to you is consider change it to an afternoon rate that starts out approximately 8 to 10 dollars for 18 holes, similar discounts for 9. And the other thing you're doing, you're chasing me with the increases you put on guests. The weekend is over 50 dollars and 35. You're not getting many members inviting guests. If I invite you to the house, I pay. I think that's out of line. Give you a safe synopsis if we increase those rates, just mathematically. We pull up the course between 2 and 7 o'clock, 18 holes. You know how much revenue you would generate? Now, this is my calculation. That comes to approximately $691,000. That means full utilization. In any business you want, run, you want your facilities to be operated 100%. You're never going to get to it, but you're not looking at 700000 So our recommendation is consider a rate reduction for afternoon to increase your utility rates. Thank you. SK? Yeah, it's, our time is over already, but I'd like to make... Uh, my name is S.K. Park. I reside at 4008 2D, and I'd like to make a comment of our budget process. Mr. CEO, we need to look at our expenses first, not increase HOAs. We need to look at expenses, cut down the expenses first. And also, for the record, I will provide this copy to the clerk. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, our next speaker is Sandra Bolinski. Hi, I'm Hi, here Sandra. to say thank you. Uh, this is the third time I've been here talking about the wood shop and my experiences in the wood shop. Before the other times I was talking about bullying and the general atmosphere in the wood shop. And I think both of those have improved. And for my personal situation, action was taken. I don't know exactly who by who, but I'd like to thank um, the security department, GRF, 
uh, Mr. Parker personally and the team at the Recreation Department, especially Brian Gruner. Um, my personal situation has been resolved to my great relief and changes have been made in the general atmosphere of the wood shop, in the rules governing the wood shop, the supervisors, and I'm very optimistic about the wood shop and I hope, my hope has always been that more beginners, especially women, uh, would be coming into the woodshop, and we're going to continue to work on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Jeff, did you want to say anything about the changes or anything? Just, uh, real quickly, we um, we had a couple meetings, um, and appreciate Senator's comments. Um, the um, um, Brian and his staff um, put together some um, new um, responsibilities and rules and regulations with regards to managing the operation there, and they had a really good training um, with with our volunteers and comments from everybody on what would work most efficiently and the most effective, and his team's done a great job putting that in place, and I think that's going to go forward and make, make some good positive changes. Thank you, and thank you both for the good news. That's nice to hear. Our next speaker is Larry Green. Larry Green, 477P. I want to talk about the special meeting you had with the, with the fee review. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought whoever came up with those uh, m the money was totally unrealistic, especially even though I'm a golfer, I'm really complaining more about the clubhouses, uh, three, five, one, the, the chart that I saw was totally unrealistic. The people who are taking, even coming up with those fees are not paying attention to what's going on in the village. And I'm about finished with that. I will like to talk about the golf thing, about how much money. I actually think the uh, guests should be paying more on weekends, and we should also qualify, get a holiday fee for the guests, especially on Mondays. You come out here doing the especially during the winter on a Monday, and it, there's more people guest playing than there are members. Each, each foursome has a member, but that's about it. Uh, she, he says that, that it's too much. Well, if you go to any other golf course, a public golf course that's not even half as good as our golf course, you're paying more money than that. So I, I think there should be looked into that part, especially the, the holiday rates. We don't charge them for holiday rates as, as a weekend. And I think that definitely should be. That's one way to co collect more money for that area. Thank you. You're welcome. Cheryl. Our next speaker is Clara Ellie. Corky. Corky. You're up. Yes, Corky. Oh, excuse me. I can't hear it that well. Uh, my name's Corky Ely. I live in 24012E Mariposa West. And I'm here in order of the trust. What's happened to our trust is disgusting to me because it has been broken all over the place. Nobody pays any attention to the trust. The management company, PCM, and there's the management company, BMS, for these people. For us, the homeowners, we never vote on anything around here anymore. This is getting ridiculous. I've got the documents, all of the documents with the trust. I've broken it down. And this is ridiculous what has happened because all of our property is being sold or it's a big business going on around here. And this is ridiculous. This is the homeowners association. You're not supposed to be making big time money around here. The first thing it was is the... Uh, Grant deed. 
is for Leisure World, not Laguna Wood Village. The regulatory agreement, you've broken the regulatory agreement even, between uh, GRF, because you're not supposed to do any of these things. I put on the cover of this what you've broken. On five, it says the foundation shall not go into voluntary liquidation, carry into effect any plan of reorganization of the foundation, or effect any change whatsoever in the capital structure of leisure world. Not any other place. Six, the foundation shall maintain the community facility property, the grounds, the building, and the equipment and a prudent thereto in good repair and in such condition as will preserve the health and safety of the users of the property. Nine is the big one. The foundation shall not file any petitions in bankruptcy or for receiver or in sovereignty or in reorganization or composition or make any assignment for the benefit of the creators or permit an adjudication of the community facility property or any part thereof by receivers or the seizure and sale okay. of the community facility property or any part thereof under judicial process Qu or quirky. pursuant to any power of sale. Thank you. Quirky. Well, my time is up, but there's one thing I would like to have a little bit more time on, just one thing. Qu quirky. You can bring that up at our meeting next month. Your time is up for this month, and we have heard you, and we are, we have the documents. I have them right here. May I hand you these papers? Yes. That I've broken the trust up into four places. <laughs> and I would like to give you this, and I'd like these papers back. After you read them. I'll return them. Okay. Yes. Thank you. This one right here is the main one. And then these go with them. All right. Corky, may I return them to you at next Thank month? Thank you very much. Corky, may I return them to you at next month's meeting? Okay. Thank you. All right. Next. Our next speaker is Cash Akrakar. All right, thank you. Not next month. I want him back today. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, what I have to say is really not all that good. And it might hurt a few people, but it needs to be said, and I'm going to say it. <clears throat> I'm not trying to alienate anybody. I just love this community so much that everybody should hear what I have to say. One, the, our GRF has reserves of 70 plus million dollars and again, you're asking $2 per month per manor to increase the reserves. Why do we need that? GRF has increased the foundation, uh, the entrance into the place from 2,500 to 5,000. None of that money trickles to the parent associations like United and Third. We need to have some of that sent to us, at least half of that 2,500 addition should go to us. <clears throat> Sales are down, especially in the United, that's all I'm focused on, compared to Orange County. One of the reasons I believe is it could be because of the increase 
in our GRF dues that really, why are we doing it? If we cannot manage with $74 million reserves and want to ask for more, that doesn't make sense to me. Uh, I think we have a great community, and I'm sure it is, world known community. Let us keep it for another 50 years. It is longer than I am alive. And every one of you is alive. So let's do that. Let us make sure, look long term, the effect of whatever we do, not just short term, what we can do next year. Look at what we can do for the long term duration, long term effects of our every action. Thank you. Thank you, Cash. Next, please, Cheryl. Next speaker is Maxine McIntosh. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. You know, that was an excellent VMS report. I was really impressed. <clears throat> and I was especially interested in that employee newsletter they're putting out each month. I thought, what an excellent tool. Um, for new employees to understand the uniqueness of an age-restricted retirement community when they first arrive. <clears throat> it was during 2012 when Al Foster was the GRF president, or else 2013, while Lynn Dvorak was president of GRF, that the GRF board and much of our talented staff all uh, visited all the clubhouses. They were looking to study the physical condition of each clubhouse. Um, after studying all their notes, the decision was made to prioritize rehabilitating Clubhouse 1 before Clubhouse 3, also known as the PAC. Clubhouse 3, the Performing Arts Center, has only three meeting rooms and two kitchens with no large banquet room at all and no patios at all. Clubhouse 1 has four meeting rooms, three kitchens, plus a kitchenette in the uh, art studio, a huge patio across the back, and ample patios down the north side of the building. Also, a large banquet room. Many, many more village members utilize Clubhouse One than Clubhouse Three. I haven't even mentioned the additional amenities housed in and around Clubhouse One. Nearly all our buildings are feeling their age, and Clubhouse One is the oldest. Clubhouse One has the greatest need. With so many staff changes over the past four years, that prioritized project list may not have been shown to this board. You may not even have seen it. Please move Clubhouse One into first position for a remodel, a facelift, or a renovation where necessary. Also, I'd like to thank uh, the board's support of the gate arms being installed everywhere. Right now, you can't get into United unless you're legitimate. And I, last year, had several people behind me at gate one when I was in the outside lane honk because I dared to slow down and wait for the ambassador to wave at me. They had already assumed, oh, when you're in this lane, you just fly by. And remember, Brad Hudson uh, uh, reported on all those flybys at gate three when he told us they stopped a lot of the people and told them to go back and why, have, why had they come through. So it was happening a lot. It can't happen anymore. This is wonderful. Anybody who objects to the gates must not understand how it keeps our community safer. Thank you all. Thank you, Maxine. Cheryl, are there any more? Uh, yes, our next speaker is Michael Landry. Okay. Michael Landry, 693B. Um, I've addressed this board about this before, and forgive me, I've had some health issues and I haven't been to meetings lately. Uh, but a few weeks ago, I, I started a conversation with someone who is pretty influential in the village. Um, and we discussed several subjects, one of which we've, I've already asked, discussed here about, about the uh, garbage uh, and how there is, if you have one little smidgen of food, they, the, the, uh, the, part, the, the people who pick up the garbage will 
re reject it and charge a fee, a fine, I think, to the village, if, if, I'm, if I understand it correctly. Um, so I, I would like some clarification on that if you haven't already given it, given it to me. I'm sorry, my, my memory is a little shaky right now. Um, <clears throat> but I find that charging extra for a smidgen of food in, in one container is a little excessive. Um, and the second point is bees. Um, I understand that from this person with whom I had a conversation that uh, when a hive is reported, instead of calling a beekeeper, and I understand that's like an expensive situation, but they're, that they're, instead of repositioning, removing the bees to a more suitable place away from people, they are just arbitrarily killed. That is a problem for me as, a, as a, an environmental protection nut. Uh, if we don't have bees, y'all, we're up the creek. If, uh, and, I, you know, we, we, we pay homage to the, the uh, use of uh, Roundup, saying we, we, it's not environmentally acceptable, not environmentally correct to use, so we're killing the bees rather than killing them through Roundup. We just, so I'd like some clarification on that. Um, you see, there was a hive on the roof of City Hall at one point. I understand that's gone. Honestly, the roof of a building is not the perfect place to have a beehive anyway. But we have a lot of property, it seems, um, away from buildings that could be used to keep bees. Please, let's do something about getting the, a beekeeper or an army of beekeepers to come out and rescue this poor little <coughs> beast. We need them. We need them badly. No bees, no pollination, no food. <coughs> We're done. Forgive me for my kvetching. Uh, and thank you for uh, keeping the village nice. And kudos, by the way. I had a health issue a few weeks ago, and we got home just in time for Carlos, who is the guy who takes care of the water, watering area. And uh, he helped me to my house. A sweetheart. I call him Senor uh, Aguado, uh, uh, Regador del Agua. Uh, he regulates the water. Kudos to Carlos. Thank you. You're welcome. Cheryl. Okay, our last speaker is D. Bacchus. Good morning. Darlene back is 4023A. I've been a resident for many years and I need an answer. I know each and every one of you can answer. In receiving the latest GRF neutral directors list dated February 19, 2019, I made note that there were here last time uh, there, there was an update, it was in October of 18, and that's too long in between publications. To the members of our community, this list is very important, or should be. It lists all of our directors and positions held, telephone numbers and addresses. Checking the update list, I made note that there are 11, I repeat, 11 directors who have chosen not to take calls from the members who voted them into office. When you dial GRF, three members, the president being one, you receive, hello, I'm Whitney Hort Thornton, the secretary for VMSI. The other eight directors, the telephone is answered by Cheryl <coughs> Silker, corporate office secretary, leave a message. Why are we paying corporate secretaries to answer board directors' telephone calls? I like to know who takes responsibility for this act. I know being a director is a demanding job. I understand that you do not want to take calls in the evening and early in the morning. However, with all the new technology, you can set your phone, and you do not have to take after-hour calls. Board members are trusted 
with money and property of the association. They are held to a high standard and must avoid conflicts of interest. They are deemed fiduciaries and have a duty to act in the best interest of the membership. Spending more money to have someone do your work is not being a volunteer. The primary duty is care of the residents, and your duty is loyal to the loyalty to the members, not to the corporation. I thought being a board member meant being a friend to all the members and wanting to hear our concerns. We have over 850 employees. I think we have enough. We should, and if you can't do the job, I suggest you resign. Thank you. That concludes our speakers for this item. All right. Now responses to open forum. Diane, would you like to go first? Uh, yeah, I'll start with what was last um, for Darlene. So the list that I have is October 2018, and there are three people who have Cheryl's number, three GRF directors. So the other directors aren't GRFs. Um, and, I, and my understanding is that Cheryl just takes a message. But the other is that you didn't vote for GRF directors. I just wanted to correct those. You vote for your mutuals, but you don't vote for us. But I understand what you're saying, and this should be updated. And, and I think it is, uh, but and it can, we can always update things more frequently. So um, the other thing I wanted to mention was, um, let's see. Um, I was curious, uh, I'm, I'm interested in what you guys are saying about the golf course. Um, I would be happy to sit down and talk with you about it. Um, the one thing I would say is that when you make a cheaper rate in the afternoons, you, you may not necessarily create more usage in the afternoon, or you might not, in, not get more users. You might just move people from the more expensive morning to the less expensive afternoon, which would defeat the purpose of what you're trying to do. But, um, but I certainly hear what you're saying, and I appreciate what you're doing, and like I say, would, would, um, would be willing or interested to talk to you, as I assume would also be Annette with the CAC. Um, and, um, oh, Cash. Is Cash still here? Okay. So, uh, if I can read my notes, I think you said GRF has has reserves of seven hundred million dollars. Seventy-four. Yeah, GRF doesn't have seventy million dollars in reserves. We just don't. And um, the trust facilities fee, it is a law. The reason it only goes to GRF is that it is the law. There are only three uh, entities in the state of California that are allowed to assess the fee, and those are the three. Uh, original Leisure World properties, which is Seal Beach, uh, Walnut Creek, and uh, Laguna Woods, um, that are organized under a trust. So if you want to see the law, I can show you the law. And that's why it can't go to the mutuals. It's, it's not the mutuals money. Like I say, it, it's a law. And the third thing you said was that sales were down in Orange County. Um, I don't know what it is for United. I, I mean, I, 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 I have it. I, I, uh, what I looked at for my report was um, overall sales in the village, and they are down 14%. And the figure I have is that in Orange County, they were down 16%, so that we are slightly better than Orange County. Um, and some of these things, I just think it's irresponsible to say them on television until you know for sure that they're true, especially the thing about the trust facilities fee. Um, let's see. Um, and to Maxine, um, we do have $10 million in our five-year capital plan for Clubhouse One. Um, I, I think you might be missing that what we are doing in Clubhouse Three or the Performing Arts Center to this point are the safety issues. Um, uh, we aren't. We don't yet have in our budget like we're. Well, in any case, we're far enough along. We have the design. The designs are being done to sort of call that back at this point, sort of waste all that money. But, um, but like the decision was made. I didn't make the decision. When I got here, Clubhouse 3 was the Performing Arts Center was what was going forward. And so we are trying to address Clubhouse 1. In fact, they've done, I think, demo, uh, some deconstructive testing or something um, of it. So we're, we are actively working on that. Um, and I think I have said enough. 
Is there anything I was supposed to address and I didn't? No, I don't think so. Oh, and to the person that, to Michael Landry, if you have a, I think you're talking about the trash at your house. And I think you're talking about bees at people's houses. And so that's either the, that's either the third board or the United board, I think. But um, that was all. All right, we're going around the circle. Let's go to um, Judith first, and then we'll go to Pat. I'll just pick up on what uh, Diane said, just uh, what Cash was worried about. The facilities fee has a name for a reason. It's called facilities fee because it's designated to the facilities by law. And so that should clear that up for everybody else. Um, and Ms. DeBacchus, I'd like to give you my card. It has my number on it. As far as I know, um, all the mutuals plus GRF distribute a telephone list. And everybody, yeah, so you have it. So it's very few people have their name, the number of VMS on there. Ten people have VMS numbers. I'm not aware of that. But you can certainly call me, and I have a card if anyone else who wants one. Thank you. Okay, okay, Pat. All right. Um, I just wanted to say a little bit about what Maxine said uh, with regard to Clubhouse One as opposed to the performing arts. Uh, I do agree with her. We need to prioritize, and it seems like Clubhouse One would be a higher priority than the performing arts because a lot more of our people utilize Clubhouse One as opposed to Clubhouse 3. We have a lot of outsiders, true, that utilize Clubhouse 3. Uh, and like Maxine said, there are not very many rooms in Clubhouse 3, but Clubhouse 1, there are a lot of rooms, and they're utilized by many clubs and many different entities. So um, priority uh, is always the most important thing we should do. And we need to look at what contract we have so far as far as the performing arts is concerned. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? OK, Joan. First of all, to the beekeeper. <laughs> I had bees, and I called around to find that it takes a lot of money to transport the bees from our area. That's the reason they don't, that we can't. So they, rather than, uh, unfortunately, um, I feel like you do. I hate to see them go but they were in the they were in a chair on my balcony and it was horrible um, and they tend to do that wherever they can find a place as far as finding a place maybe on the grounds that's a, a topic worth talking about and I, I do agree with that um, regarding uh, Maxine regarding uh, Clubhouse 3 the reason that Clubhouse 3 was put forward was because of a safety issue and possible lawsuits with the backstage conditions. It was not safe, and we have performances there all the time you know, that serve the entire village. So that was one of the reasons they pushed it, just FYI. But we are working on Clubhouse 1 as well. Um, and Darlene Bacchus? For sure, I think my my number is on there mm -hmm. for sure for the uh, for GRF. You can call me anytime. I'd be happy to hear from you. And I uh, had one more person. Are you going to talk? Um, okay. Maybe not. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you. Okay, and now we're going to have Jim Matson. Are you going to speak to that for just a minute, Jim? Turn on your mic. On Clubhouse One. Um, we have um, quite a bit of information on the um, status of that facility, and it's currently under review by our staff engineering group. And right now, um, we are going to be getting a presentation in over a month, which roughly it'll be sep September the 1st. I think we've addressed everything. Okay. Next, we'll I, go on. I got to... something to say too. Oh, okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, concerning the uh, wood shop comment, I'm glad uh, the things are 
uh, squared away over there. I like that wood shop very much. I get in there every once in a while, so I'm I'm glad to hear that um, you're, every, you're satisfied with that. That's all I have. Okay. Okay. Next, we're going to be on to the consent calendar. So all matters listed on. Under the consent calendar, considered routine and will be enacted by the board by one motion in the form listed before. Okay. okay. And then, yeah. Go ahead, John. Um, I move we consent, move we accept the consent calendar. I second it. Okay, Pat seconds it. All right. All move. those in favor? Are we going to vote electronically, Cheryl? Okay, then we'll wait. It's on the calendar. It's on the uh, tablet. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Director Phillips, can I have your vote? And Director Matson. You have to vote, Jim. Oops. Yes. Your yes? Yes, it's not showing up. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right. Okay. Who's missing? Oh, Beth. Oh, okay. That's right, it's Beth, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay, next we'll be on unfinished business, number 12. <laughs> this is to entertain a motion to approve a resolution to authorize the 27 whole golf course summer closures. The, ju the June initial notification. It was 28-day notification for member review to comply with Civil Code Section 4360 has been satisfied. Okay. Do we have any comments? Oh. No. Yep. Resolution 90-19, double X, 27-hole golf course summer closures. Whereas at the May Community Activities Committee meeting, staff recommended approval to authorize the closure of nine holes per week as needed on the 27-hole golf course when extreme summer weather is negatively affecting the golf course to allow proper maintenance and time for the fairways and greens to recover. Whereas in July and August 2018, the golf course was subjected to very high temperatures and above normal levels of humidity. And whereas extreme weather caused extensive stress and damage on the different grass surfaces creating poor playing and maintenance conditions. And whereas authorizing the Recreation and Special Events Department to close one course, nine holes, at a time during extreme summer weather allows maintenance personnel to perform necessary work to preserve the course's playability. And whereas the absence of cart and foot traffic on the fairways and greens will allow the grass to strengthen further and whereas this closure protocol would only be utilized if absolutely necessary as determined by the golf course maintenance and operation managers, and whereas no financial impact is anticipated as there are fewer golfers in July and August, and those interested in playing would be accommodated on the remaining two nine-hole courses. And now, therefore, be it resolved July 2nd, 2019, that the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby adopts authorization of the closure of nine holes per week as needed on the 27-hole golf course when extreme summer weather is negatively acting, I'm sorry, negatively affecting the golf course to allow proper maintenance and time for the fairways and greens to recover and resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized to, on behalf of the corporation, to carry out this resolution. I move we accept this resolution. Second. All right, and now there's room for discussion. Is there any discussion? Bert. I'd like to offer, I'd like to offer an amendment. Um, 
removing the term summer, and I would like it to read basically giving them the authorization uh, to close any or all holes for periods determined by the management of the 27-hole golf course when extreme weather conditions negatively affect the golf course and so on. And I'm saying that because we could have flooding in the winter, okay, where we wouldn't allow golf carts or basically the hole to be used. I mean, there are many other causes or reasons that we may want to close one or more holes of the golf course. And I think we need to leave that to the experts. And I just think this is so limiting. It, it, okay, so I'm offering that amendment. Hey, I'll second that. Uh, yeah, th it would be that would be an, a whole alteration yeah. have to go back, I believe. Oh, yeah. oh I'm sorry. Go ahead. I think you're right. Go ahead, Joe. I believe that management can close the golf course now at any time. It's just that something has come up with the summer, and he wanted to be sure that we understood that the summer heat was to be taken care of. All right, and I believe that there's some discussion out there. Is there any discussion on this, Cheryl? Yes, we have two requests to speak. All right. Um, should we take care of the... Uh... Make sure spoken here. All right, has everyone here necessary. spoken as it relates to this amendment? Do we want, do we want this, the people coming up to speak to the amendment, or we want it to just have them come up right now? They have to speak on the amendment first. They have to speak on the amendment first. So you can speak on the amendment, and then... If the amendment passes or fails, then you get to speak on the motion. Well, on the motion, then. Okay. Do we have a second on that amendment? Pat seconded it. But why don't whoever speaks then would speak to basically the initial motion along with the addition of closing it at other times. So is there anyone? All right. That would just. Who do we have to our first speaker? Our first speaker is Sean to Tom Payne. Sean Tom Payne. You know, before I die, my name will be correctly pronounced, but I'm not giving anybody any hints. <laughs> Tom. Tom Payne. Tom Payne, like Tom. Tom Payne. Tom Payne. My name is Tom Payne. It's Irish. Um, I have prepared remarks. I have copies of which um, are being. Why don't we get, wait till everybody gets them? Okay. Okay. Is this on? Well, well, uh, that's being done. I will talk to the amendment. Uh, last winter, it rained like Noah was building another ark. The golf course was closed by staff appropriately in at least ninety percent of the cases. There's some argument on the fringes. Well, can we play or can't we play? Golfers tend to want to play no matter what. Um, there is no quarrel, I think, with the notion that staff can use their best judgment. They are the experts, as Bert points out. And on that basis, we should allow them to do what they need to do. However, the issue before us today is the one about the summer closure. And this is an exception to the general practice. So I'll read the, this now and have a couple of closing remarks, if that's all right. Mm -hmm. The Laguna Winds. Laguna Woods Men's Golf Club respectfully requests that the GRF board vote no on the proposed resolution to authorize 27 hole closures and request that the resolution be returned to the Community Activities Committee for clarification. The rationale for this is as follows. The Recreation Department did not provide a specific set of parameters that must be met in order to warrant closure of nine holes a week. This resolution also lacks second tier approval from the Recreation Department Director or the CEO for any course closure. The golf operations manager assured the CAC, I happen to be on that committee, so I was there, and GRF that any course closure would not adversely affect revenues. However, documentation supporting this contention was not furnished at that time, and to my knowledge, is still not. The 2018 summer weather of 100 degree temperatures, which is very well outlined in the resolution, by the way, combined with a high humidity may have been an anomaly. These extreme weather conditions would result in execution of a specific written and approved step-by-step -step procedure that would be followed before allowing, close course, before allowing excuse me, course closure. 
We believe that such a procedure is essential in ensuring no misunderstanding by staff or the golfing community or any of the boards and committees would ensue. Four, the Recreation Department has not yet provided the necessary written empirical procedure defining the steps to be followed to ensure best maintenance practices when dealing with extreme weather conditions. The request by the Recreation Department did not include asking for the authority to have carte blanche to close portions of the golf course whenever the recreation so chooses, no matter what the weather conditions are. This request is, was submitted specifically to deal with extreme weather conditions only, not just to give the course a break from normal use. I will say that the men's club is not against the concept of giving staff the right to make these decisions. We only wish to see visibility so we all are reading from the same sheet of music. And thus, so far, that has not been done. CAC was given a couple of assurances, but there has been discussions in the community about, well, they're planning on closing the golf course in August. Well, it's when I heard it, it was still June. And how do we know it's going to be 105 degrees, 75% humidity on August 15th? I don't think we do. So we would like the CAC to be given direction from staff to show what exactly are you going to do, in what order. This, this is not rocket science. This can be done. And so that everyone feels comfortable with the decision when it's made to close, and we all agree with it. The financial impact has not been studied. It's just a, you know, up against the wall. We don't think it'll be adversely affected because old people don't play golf when it's 110 degrees outside. I don't think that's a fair and reasonable amendment. rationale. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right. We're voting on the amendment. We have a, all right, would you, oh, we have we have another one more speaker. Person? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, Larry Green. I certainly can't do and talk like he does, but I agree with everything he said. Uh, the fact that you are, think that no fiscal impact is wrong, there will definitely be fiscal impact. Amendment. You saw what happened during this, this winter. I mean, there won't be as big an impact as that. But you're compressing people who want to go out there and play. Excuse me. All right. We, what we're trying to say is that you have to speak to the amendment right. and the amendment right now. And... <laughs> Um, talk to the okay. Basically, um, the amendment we're has trying to, to do with other uh, conditions and weather conditions, and uh, yeah. I, I don't think that should pass either. The whole thing should be put back to committee. Okay. I, so, but what you're saying, even even for this for the amendment, it should be brought back to committee. That's correct. your take on it. You're not correct. for it. Okay. Thank you, Larry. Can I, how about the other stuff? Can I, I no, only have no. We have to vote on the amendment first, and then you can come back up. All right. Anybody else? The All right, Cheryl, would you please restate the amendment? Uh, Director Moldell made an amendment to remove the term summer from the resolution. And change it to what? All right, Bert, is that what you said? I'm sorry, and, I'm just trying to clarify this. And authorize the closure of any or all holes for periods determined by the management of the 27-hole golf course when extreme weather conditions are negatively affecting the golf course. So you're saying you can shut the entire course down, closure of any, any and or all. all. Any or all. Any hole or, or all, all holes. Or all holes. Okay, so that would be complete. I uh, just want to make sure I have that clear, so that would give him the authority to shut down the entire 27 holes, correct? If, if certain conditions, if it deemed, they deem it necessary, absolutely. Okay. No, Cheryl, are we going to vote on the amendment by hand, or? On your screen. On the screen, okay. <laughs> well, this doesn't say, this is just to, oh, this motion to amend. Okay, got it. All right. Uh, Director Matson, your vote. Yay or nay, you can give me a verbal vote. Talking to me? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. 
I punched it really good. What is your verbal vote? Yes or no? Yes. And then I get to vote. Correct? You um, I just can't find it on the screen. My verbal vote is no. No. Okay, the vote is tied, therefore it fails. Thank you, Jim. You can now make an amendment to send it back. Now we vote on the main motion. Okay, now we have to vote on the main motion, oh, can I? which is to entertain a motion to approve the resolution. Can I again make another amendment? Yes. Okay. Um, never mind, I'll pass. Okay, you withdraw that? All right. All right, so now we are back to, I, I just want to say, I, I, in terms of the original um, resolution, I was, I was just going to say I'm in favor of it. This is what staff asked for. I, I think we should give them the discretion that they need. They're professional. Uh, you know, I think that the, um, the details of how it will work will come out later, but we don't really want them to spend all their time working on details of things that we don't even pass. So I'm sure that there'll be a procedure, and I'm sure that it will be sufficient. All right. Now the, okay, Brian, did you want to say anything or speak to this? On procedure. And this is on procedure. On the procedure itself? Yes. It's not, it's not defined in the resolution. It's not defined in the resolution. Well, the procedure would be such that, um, you know, obviously depending on the weather conditions and if there is adverse condition, if the weather is affecting the course adversely, as determined by our golf course um, maintenance manager and uh, Tom McCray, our golf operations manager, that we would um, provide sufficient notice in any potential closures coming up or, or any updates on the condition of the actual course itself. Um, so this is a new procedure to us, and it's just something that we want to get informative information out to the players and the golfers on the condition of the course and what our in intent is. And we obviously want to provide enough notice so that they can adjust their tee times. And it's not that we're looking to close the entire course. We're looking to close a section at a time. So the players would still be able to play on the course itself. Um, so if we're shutting down nine holes, the other 18 would still be available. And um, current, I mean, historic, you know, data indicates that during extreme heat and weather, uh, the, 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 the amount of golfers out there does go down quite a bit. So we feel that we can comfortably accommodate every golfer without really um, any disturbance to their daily activity. Because the resolution does address extreme hit, heat and humidity. Right. So it's, could you give us like an example of that? Well, last year we had um, very high humidity levels um, in addition to over 100, 100 degree temperatures and the greens were actually uh, became really soft and any time a ball would hit the green, it would actually create a huge divot inside the green itself. Um, so it's just additional work that is, is very difficult for our staff to maintain and repair. So we want to have the option to give the course a rest so we can maintain the course properly. Um, so by shutting down nine, leaving 18 holes open, and then, you know, next week there will be another nine shut down, and then, there, so there's always 18 holes open for, for play, is, is, is our intent. All right. Can I? Yeah. Yes, Joe. Am I to understand, though, the whole course could be cut down? shut down if there were an emergency such as flooding or something like yes, that Yes, and nature. we have done that. And you, you've done that in the past, and that's an entirely different, it's not a different procedure, but it's for a different reason. This is a little bit of a different reason. Um, if there is extreme, I mean, if we have flooding, yeah, we, like for example, in February, we did shut down the whole entire course simply because it's too wet, and we don't want golf carts driving mm. on, the green, you know, on the fairways. Um, or people even walking on the greens for that matter because it was simply so saturated that we shut down the entire course. Now this is a little bit different where we just want to put people on notice and, and let the board know that this is a, a potential um, 
you know, thing that we can do, or it's, it's something in our utility to go ahead and shut down the cores if we feel it's necessary in extreme weather temperatures, um, such as in the summer time frame. All right. Um, thank you. And then we'll start. Okay. Thank you. It looks like there was a question from Bert, and then Larry's right. out in the audience. And if there's nobody else up here on the die, it's after Bert and Larry. Will is, speak. is there a resolution describing what you just said? Um, not that I'm, I mean, I haven't looked for a resolution. It's just because if we don't have a resolution done. for that, I don't understand why we have a resolution being proposed for this. Like what rule? There's no resolution. Maybe, could, I mean, first of could all. Could I say something? Yes. I think, I may be wrong, Brian, but tell me. When staff is in charge of the golf course, it's their obligation to take care of the golf course. That doesn't require a resolution. But this particular situation is an exception to the usual and shutting down part of the golf course at a time is different from closing the entire golf course for an emergency. That's Am I right, Brian? Is that the sort that of thing you're yeah. thinking about? I don't yeah. know. That's correct. So it doesn't require a resolution to, for them to simply maintain the golf course. But this is not just a simple maintenance. That's all I'm saying. When I stipulate any or all, wouldn't that cover it? He can close out in one hole, and I'm sure you do, mm -hmm. right? We've already voted that down, so that's not an issue. Okay. All right, Ray? It simply said, staff is trying to save the, the complex or the, the, the golf course, period. End of quote. That is the most important thing. They have control of it. They know what's going on. Let's give them the opportunity to handle it to save us millions of dollars in the long run. Yep. All right. Um, Brian, if you're done, I think we've got somebody else out there that wants to chat. Larry? I've said enough. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Dick Palmer? I'm sorry. Larry goes out before you, but Dick Palmer is the person right now. Dick, would you please? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I vote in favor of this motion because staff <clears throat> is responsible for the golf course, and whatever they want to do is to protect the course itself. So I, I don't see what all this fall the roll is about. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, now we have Larry. They uh, say this will not affect money, but it will. You just close down nine holes, you're going to expect money in the morning tremendously. In the afternoon, it won't affect much, but it'll affect other people who like to go out for nine holes. And with not a lot of people out there, in the hot sun, you can get around an hour and 15 minutes. But if you increase compress everybody together, then you're out there play, uh, for nine holes playing two hours and 30 minutes and, and 18 for five hours, rather than getting out, out a lot faster through less than four hours for 18 and less than an hour and a half for uh, nine holes, which I like to go out there for nine holes, and it's really hot, I can handle it for an hour and a half, but I'm not gonna go out there for two and a half hours or uh, in the middle of the summer so uh, what you're doing is compressing all the times to just two, two nines, and it'll really back people up and make it um, be playing there a lot longer. And that's not what we've been about during the summer. Only during the winter do we compress it that much. Thank you. Okay. Darlene all right, Darlene Bacchus, uh, mm -hmm. four zero two three uh, dash A. I'm not a golfer. I'm not familiar with this, but. Is this done throughout Southern California and the nation that people don't have enough sense not to go out when it's, so they see that it's going to be extreme heat? Are we the only golf course in this part of the country that closes our course down or wants to close it down I and can't that. take care of it, can't maintain it without closing it? You know, that's an excellent question. And I really don't have the answer to that. Is, does anyone here, has anybody done any research? I don't I have no idea. Well, I, uh, okay. wouldn't that be a place to go first before you uh, added this I, I, additional charge of employees closing and opening? And I think Brian might be able to answer that. Brian? Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, you're welcome. I don't have the exact data on that of, of other golf courses closing. I do know a lot of the private country clubs, um, they would. Um, obviously, they have more discretion in regards to closing it. 
Um, I do just want to say that we're not an average golf course. We have over 120,000 rounds of golf a year, which is very heavily used. Um, and the maintenance required to maintain the course is very extensive. Um, so, but I, we can certainly look into other public golf courses in regards to their closing procedures. All right, thank you. All right, Diane, you wanted to speak? I was just gonna speak to, uh, to Larry. Um, what it says is the resolution says there will be no financial impact. So it's possible that we would have a little bit lower fee, but, it's, but it might also be that we have less expense because if they did play, we would have to do more repair of the course. And the only other thing I kind of have to say is that I think when the ball lands on the green, I think it's called a ball mark. So, and I think it's a divot if I do it with my club. That was just a game. Okay, and uh, I think, is there anybody else out in the audience that would like to speak to this? Any more discussion? Any more discussion? All right. Hearing none. Hearing none? Let's vote. Let's vote. Thank you. <coughs> okay, the, uh, yes. let's see, I've yes. got everybody. Uh, Director Muldow, your vote. Oh, you abstain. No, we've got everybody. Never mind. Okay, the motion passes. All right, next. Moving on, we have a entertain a motion to ratify the board decision to not renew the Fox Sports West and Fox Sports Prime ticket contracts for the 2020 cable television channel lineup. The June initial notification, 28 day notification for member review to comply with civil code section 4360 has been satisfied. Joan, do you have to read it? I move. I, all right, go ahead, Joan. I so move. All right. I so move that we ratify this. Someone has a second. second. All right. Now discussion and Chuck. Now we have to have, um, do we have, Chuck, we should have Chuck's presentation before the discussion? In the discussion. Or in the discussion, I'm sorry. No. Go ahead. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, members of the board. I'd like to get it, uh, get your attention here to the presentation on the on the on the board here. What we're trying to do here is give uh, some explanation about what we're trying to do here with the Fox Regional Sports Channels. Um, those contracts are coming due um, at the end of the year, and we are looking at the overall cost of those two channels. So I want to give you a presentation of how we came to the, uh, the recommendation to the board to, to not remove those two particular channels just because of the weight of the cost compared to the rest of the cable channels that we have on our channel lineup. So if you can go to channel, uh, if you can go to, there you go, the next slide here. What I really want to show everybody here is cable TV is bought, bought here for the village as a bulk agreement. The mutuals actually buy cable TV directly from the programmers. Individual homeowners don't buy cable TV. By all of us pooling our resources together for all 12,736 homes, we get a discounted rate for programming. So you can see totally your programming bill from NC, you know, from ABC, CBS, so on and so forth, is about five point six million dollars annually. If you did not have that bulk agreement, your cost for programming would be eleven point five million dollars annually. So by you having the cable TV as a shared amenity, it saves the community five point nine million dollars a year. But with that being said. $5.6 million is still a lot of money for programming, right? That equivocates to about nine, uh, if you look at um, the overall shared cost of this amenity, it's about $19.32 per manor per month. If you go to the next slide, please. With the, uh, so how does this, how does it impact the individual resident? Uh, with your bulk cable agreement, you, you, you split up that, that $5.6 million is about $25 per manor per month. Without 
the bulk agreement, each manor would be paying $62 per manor per month. So by having that bulk agreement, uh, collectively pulling all of our resources together, you're saving each member $37 per month. Next screen, please. So that brings me to a conclusion. I'm, I'm sorry, it brings me to the point. The Fox Sports West and Fox Sports Prime Ticket, just two channels alone, cost you 33% of that whole entire $5.6 million. That's about one. They came at us this year with a 25% increase, which would take your Fox programming bill from $1.5 million to $1.8 million over a one-year period. Again, that's about 33% of the overall entire programming budget of the entire community. With that being said, uh, it's been my obligation and my fiduciary responsibility to bring that to the board's attention is like, do those two channels, are they worth that money for the demographics that we have at the village? And obviously that decision has come to, a, uh, it's coming to a, a culmination here today. So let's take a look at that. What's that going to look like if we don't renew those uh, th that channel? Next slide, please. So right now, if I can get your guys' attention, bear with me. The people who are plugging directly into the wall, right? if you look at this right here, they're paying $19.32 per manor per month. If you have a HD set-top box, you're paying 32. If you have a DVR, you're paying 38. If you have the whole home DVR set up, you're paying 44. Okay. If we renewed that Fox agreement this year and we included it in your budget, that that increase is going to take you from $19.32 to twenty-four eighty-three per manner per month, right? That's if we renewed the Fox. But look what happens if we don't renew the Fox. You're going to go from the $24 down to 13 right? So exact 19 to 13. But if we didn't, we didn't do anything, it's going to go to twenty four eighty three next year. Right, so it definitely it's going to next year. This would be be thirteen dollars and, and, and six cents by lowering what we're trying to what we're trying to suggest here by lowering um, the cable bill by not removing Fox. It's going to take you to thirteen dollars and zero six cents. But then we want to encourage people to rent a set top box converter for seven ninety five that will take you to up to twenty one dollars and one cents. Now that's a difference between nineteen and twenty one. It's a few cents more of that's going to give you a, a, a digital converter box that's going to be able to give you a guide, all 300 of our HD channels, and all your channels are going to map up a map correctly with the number that we present. Your TV is going to map the actual correct number. A lot of the digital TVs that are plugging directly into the wall, you have 6.1, 7.2, and every time you have to scan the channel, the channels come up on different numbers. So what we're trying to do is get everybody to get a device on their TV, like a little digital converter device. So now you have all whole numbers, 2, 3, 7, 9, 13. Then you also get a digital channel guide. You know, the channel 3 scrolling guide, the analog guide that we removed, that's gone away. So now the only way to get the new digital guide is through a digital device. So we're, that's what we're trying to portray. Let's try it a different angle. Next slide, please. So again, the direct plug-in people, people who are plugging directly into the law, are currently paying 1932. If we don't renew Fox, their bill is going to go down to third. This is your assessment. This is your assessment portion coming out of your pocket. Your assessment portion is going to go down to 1306. But if we really want to encourage everybody to get a DTA, a, a digital converter for 7.95 per month. So the offset we're trying to say there is you really be going from 1932 to 2101, right? Now there's some important things about those little converters. A couple of things that they're doing. Not only are they going to provide you with uh, all 300 channels of our HD content, high definition programming. What it's also going to be able to do is for, uh, to allow us to encrypt our cable TV channels. Uh, right now we're uh, we we're able to broadcast all these channels in the clear when we're using uh, analog technology. But now that we're using all digital technology, the programmers are requiring us to encrypt all those channels that go to your home. Um, in order for us to do that, um, you have to have a device. Why is that important? Remember that bulk agreement I was mentioned earlier, how we all pull our resources together? Well, those agreements are coming due to be renewed in order for us to renew those agreements and save the community that $5.9 million, $5 million a year, we have to prove to them that we're encrypting our cable TV channels. Okay, So it's something we're trying to push here. Okay, Next slide, please. So some of the folks out there, have we got rid of those two uh, regional sports channels? What does that mean? What's, that, what's the impact to the resident? That's the Angels, the Clippers, 
the kings and the ducks will no longer be viewed on the network here inside the village. But with today's technology, though, there are alternate locations you can get that. You can always run a, a dish or a direct TV, but you could also go to one of these services here online and stream it over the internet. Um, you can see the, uh, the, 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 the expense per, per home is much more than what you're paying now. But uh, that $1.8 million for those two channels for everybody to pay for when you probably have really a seriously a couple hundred uh, serious uh, sports fan, it's definitely worth for them to go direct and not have everybody paid that, um, that fee in their assessments every month. Uh, another thing we want to take a look at is remind those folks out there, next slide please, is if you are plugging in directly into the wall and you do not get a curtain con converter box, once we get a chance, once we are uh, in a position where we have to encrypt these, uh, the cable TV channels, these are the channels that uh, I'll give you a list later. But these are the, the, the channel lineup you're going to be left with. It's going to be about 50 channels. These are all your over local over-the-air channels only. They are not cable TV channels. And you also you get the 50 or so music channels. They're all local networks. You'll get your basics, the CBS, the NBC, Fox News, ABC, so on and so forth, and your village television. But broadcasting like Discovery, Sci-Fi Channel, you know, ESPN, over-the-air, unencrypted, is no longer going to be... Um, possible here at the village very soon okay cruising to that next slide for me please so this would be the channel lineup that you'd have left this would be all the over over the air local over the air channels if you're plugging directly in uh, without a device these are the only channels that you'll be able to uh, get on that device so I guess what I'm trying to impress upon you today is there's a couple different things one is the significant cost of this Fox TV uh, Fox regional sports networks by not renewing them also, to impress upon you, the, there's going to be, on the cable TV side, there's going to be a, a reduced amount that you're paying in your assessments for cable TV. We're hoping that's going to be enough to offset uh, you personally to be able to go ahead and rent that 795 DTA so you can get all the encrypted content, get yourself a channel guide, and have a much better experience at home. But we know that some people, they just don't watch TV. Um, maybe they do all their stuff streaming online. Um, and maybe they don't want to pay the seven ninety five a month. I just want to let you know that if you don't, these are the channels that you have left over. Now that's uh, I'm I'm willing and happy to take any questions uh, if the board or any of our members of the audience have any questions about this. Thank you. Any questions from the board or and from the and, and, and from the room? Mm -hmm. Yes, we have two different uh, DVR products. One has allows you to record two two shows at one time. One allows you to record six shows at one time. Oh, my <laughs> Call broadband services. We'll hook you up. We need that right away. <laughs> we have a, we have some questions back here. Do you want them to come up here or no questions over here? Should I pass the mic? Should so there's some questions out here. All right. You want to come up? No. He wants you to call. Uh, it's a question. Um, right now, I have the box that only can record two at a time. Is there a charge for me to change over to the one that records six at a time? Am I even allowed to do that? Uh, yeah, you can change it up, but the fee is different. It, it is more. You're paying nineteen twenty-five. I do believe for yes. the box, and the other, the new six channels, uh, twenty-four ninety-five. I think. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, D, go please. Um, I'd like to know what the cost is for the music channel. There's uh, about 50 music channels, and uh, it's, it's very, very minimal. It's a few cents per man or per month. But what does that mean to me? That it means that you're paying a few cents per, per man in your assessments. Cents? Is it uh, 99 cents? I think it's less than, it's less than 30 cents. I'll have to get those exact figures for you. Okay. About three years ago, I, I went through and figured uh, out everything that this broadband system takes. Uh, and it, it, came in, it came to billions, and uh, I mean, not, not millions. 
And we're not paying any 13 or $21. We're getting nickeled and dimed to death with this. And now we don't even have a channel guide. And the way technology is progressing, we're no longer going to need a DVR. It's going to be held in the cloud. And we're so far behind on all this, and we've had so much taken away from us that I think it's impo I think it's just I think it's criminal. I think we should, if I had my way, we would abolish the broadband system totally and just have one in-house channel for our community, for our meetings, for us, like it used to be, and and just get, and then have. Every, get a major company that would come into our community and they would provide the television, they would provide the trucks, the equipment, the men, the uniforms, and we wouldn't have to buy all the stage equipment and block off all that area for broadband. This is ridiculous. It's a waste of money. And they do this in Walnut Creek. And they do have their closed channel, but it's seventy dollars a month per manor. And then, if you want additional, you take it. But streaming is coming, and we're not going to need this antiquated uh, setup. Thank you. I think. Uh, thank you, Dee. I think you, you pointed out. Thank you. I think you pointed out uh, something actually really important. So with the, the shared service, uh, shared cost service uh, concept that we have here at the village, you're paying uh, next year, if we don't renew Fox, you'll be paying $13 and some change to get your um, basic cable TV. Uh, thank you, Dee, for pointing out Walnut Creek's paying 70 So absolutely, you're able to definitely uh, move away and outsource your broadband services. But uh, yeah, we can bring in that operator for Walnut Creek and then we'll have everybody pay $70 per month. That's a possibility. I myself have Spectrum at home, my basic cable with my internet and two boxes is $180 a month. Here, that, here the same service that you're getting, the same internet speeds with the set to, with your DVR is less than 50. So that's, a, that's the, the value that the uh, broadband services is bringing to the community. Now broadband services is not a third party company. It's your department. It's your guys' cable TV plant. And of course, it's your decision if you want to keep it. All right. Excuse me, Chuck. I think there's somebody else that wants to speak. However, we have seemed to lost. Please follow the procedure. Fill out the card and then come speak. And stay on the topic. No, no. topic. And stay on topic. Thank you. All right. Go ahead, Chuck. Uh, what we're discussing today is the re uh, is not renewing the Fox contracts. Does she have a comment about Mary Walden? Yeah, I Pardon? Here we go. Chuck, was there anything else? No. Okay, all right. Um, go ahead, Don. Yeah, Chuck, um, I'm for this. We have to save money, and what we're paying now is ridiculous mm -hmm. the, uh, for those two sports channels. However, a lot of us still want to watch sports, and you say these are the only choices that you oh, list okay. here? Yeah, there, there are lots of other choices out there. If you have a, a, a Fire Stick or a Roku, I'm talking, you know, it's a hardware device that you, have, you can plug into your TV and you can get these different services. Those are just one of a handful of services online. You, if you've got a, dish, a, a, a satellite dish, you know, Direct TV or a Dish Network, you could get that content or you can use one of the streaming providers that I've outlined on that report. But those are really the only ones. For instance, the Angels Baseball, you can get a subscription for the MLB uh, network for $24 a month. But I have to tell you, they always block out the local games. If it's a home game, they, they, they block them out. Hmm. So it's, it's, it's definitely challenging. Now you mentioned NBA TV coming fall of 2019. What would the cost of that be? I, it's not published as of yet, but I'm assuming it's going to be very similar to the NHL network, which is $9.99 a month. Now on the ML uh, on the MLB network, you can actually subscribe just to Angels Baseball for seven dollars a month. But again, it's the away game. You can only see the away games, not the home games. Okay. Diane, I also speak in favor of this, and I just wanted to say two things. One is that we are not getting rid of Fox News, just to make sure that's clear. Um, the other, I guess, I should say is that. Uh, somebody said something about we were doing something that was criminal, and I just wanted to make sure that everyone knows that wasn't isn't true. Um, and the third thing is, did you mention that we were going to try to put it in a clubhouse? 
Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. For those folks out there who are really big sports fans, we're going to try getting some services hooked up at the Village Green and some of the clubhouses. So if you need to watch, if you would like to watch the Angels games uh, or the Clippers or the Ducks or the, uh, or the Kings, uh, we'll find some kind of facilities throughout the community to be able to show those games. Okay. I think that that's about it then. I think it's about time for us to, to ratify to vote. Okay. Cheryl on screen, right? All right, everybody, please use your tablet. Uh, Director Troutman, your vote. Yes. Got it. Okay. I think we got it then. Are you on? No, you're not. Jim, did you get Jim's vote? Yes. Okay, good. Okay. I don't see it reflected on there. Okay. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. All right, we're on to new business. And this will be to entertain a motion to approve supplemental appropriation for tennis center building renovation. Good, Joan. Resolution 90-19-XX, supplement funding for tennis center building renovation. Whereas the 2019 GRF capital plan appropriated funding in the amount of $75,000 for the facility from the facilities fund to renovate the interior of the tennis center building. And whereas staff met with tennis club president and tennis club members to discuss a plan that included both building interior and exterior site landscape renovation options and whereas the current capital improvement allocation of $75,000 will not sufficiently fund all proposed scopes of work for both the interior and exterior renovations and requires a supplemental appropriation to fully fund the increased scopes of work for this capital improvement project. And whereas on June 12, 2019, the MNC committee reviewed and recommended the approval and funding of the original and expanded scope of work to the Golden Rain Foundation Board. Now, therefore, be it resolved on July 2nd, 2019, the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby authorizes a supplemental appropriation of $72,640 for the renovation of the tennis building at a total project cost of $147,640. And resolved further that the officers and agents, that should be not against, agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the Golden Rain Foundation Corporation to carry out this resolution. I move we approve this resolution. Pat, second. I'll second it. All right, and any discussion? Go ahead, Judith. Okay, I'm hesitant to spend any more money on this building because when I walk into that facility or try to, or my son does, we are stopped by people who belong to the club, say we're not allowed to be there even though we show our card. I've discussed this with Brian Gruner and I'm working on positively identifying the people. If you're not a member of the club, they tell you you have to leave or they're going to call security. I thought being able to use that facility comes out of my dues. So until it's clear to the residents and to the tennis club that all of us have a right to use that building, get water there, walk, go in, watch a game, I hesitate to spend money. So thank you. You're welcome. All right, and Bert. I'm going to wind up voting against this. Uh, I've gone over to the tennis facility, and I don't play tennis right now, but I've gone over there now several times, and I've walked around, and I've talked to people. And um, first of all, for the building, there are actually two, two separate things that we're doing. We're renovating the interior of the building, and the second part is an exterior renovation, uh, which has nothing to do with the building, but it's, it's the exterior. And... Uh, that, by the way, is adding $72,000. Uh, 
Okay, now let's look at this. I, I walk in and I'm saying, look at the cabinets, and yes, they, they look a little shabby, but the, believe the proposal calls for replacement of the cabinets. And I know that cabinets can be refaced. And by refacing, you can save money. And it looks just as attractive. So that's number one. I looked at the tile floor. There are some hairline cracks in that tile floor, but it is a gorgeous floor. And I, you know, when I look at that floor, I say, why don't we just refinish the floor? I mean, you can do something to make that floor look better. Um, and, and I just don't believe that we really have to replace an entire tile floor, which, by the way, appears both on the patio. It's the same flooring that appears on the patio. It appears outside. And so for that reason, I would say uh, that I wouldn't be opposed to it. Now, I also understand that the claim was when the, the MSC met that the reason that we want to do the $72,000 in addition, which is the exterior work, is that it'd be cheaper to do both together. And I just don't understand the logic, since they're absolutely separate areas, completely separate. And to my way of thinking, if you're going to do both, you can't really wind up. If you're going to try to do both at the same time, it seems to me that the interior and exterior people working are going to get in their own way. So I would also be opposed. OK. All right. Thank you, Bert. OK, um, Pat. I'm in favor of this, and I would recommend that you vote in favor of it, because there are a lot of people that come here for tournaments and things, and our tennis courts are a showcase uh, in as much as Clubhouse 3 is, so certainly the tennis courts are. And I, I have been there, and I, have, I used to hit the ball, but uh, I used to play tennis. I'm not doing that right now. But I still think it's a great thing for our community, and I think we should put an additional 70000 into it. Thank you. Uh, Diane and then Don. Um, I hear what everybody is saying. Um, I'm not opposed to the project, but I think that some interesting questions have been raised. Um, myself, I'm not sure of <clears throat> why we're putting a desk in there, and the person that would sit at the desk doesn't seem to be facing the courts. Um, I Like Judith, I think this is a DRF facility, and I think people use it in the evening to play cards. And so I would think, I would like us to look a little more at what we're going to use the space for, and, in, the inside and the outside. So I'd like to amend this motion to move it, I think that's what I'd like to do, to move it, to send it back to C, to send it to CAC, because I don't. Yeah, move, I, move, I move, we send it. Okay, I'm moving, I move we send it to CAC and have them address it, because since it has been changed a bit, and, and um, I don't think they've addressed it, so. I move that we, uh, so I just need a second. I need a second to send it back to committee, to CAC. Do I have any seconds? Okay, Judith, you'll, you'll be the second on it. All right. <coughs> and uh, any other discussion? Don, did you want to chat? <coughs> Not on the amendment. Okay, <coughs> is there um, anybody out in the audience? Hopefully you filled out a card. Is my card first? Yes, she did fill out a card. And I have John Soule first. Good morning. John Soule, 3428C. Uh, I would respectfully ask the board not to approve the supplemental. Uh, along with Judith Troutman, uh, when I went to visit the facility, uh, someone asked me what I was doing there was uh, I here to cause trouble? And that's the first time I visited the building. So I think that uh, people over there are sometimes rude. Uh, also, uh, we heard from Jeff Parker last month talking about revenues and down. And I think that we could, should look to cut costs wherever we can. The outside work doesn't need to be, it isn't for the playing areas. It's just for around the the small building that they have, and what they have there currently can just stay the way it is, in, in my opinion. Okay, right now we're voting on the motion to return it back oh, to I'm CAC. Sorry. So is there something you'd like to say about that? You can speak on returning the motion to if you're for it or against returning I'm for the motion. It. Okay, thank you. All right, is there anybody else out in the audience that would like to speak? Uh, we have a request from... Um, 
Maxime McIntosh. All right. On the motion. On the motion. Um, on the, these are all on the original motion. <coughs> uh, on, on the, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, on the this amend affects the motion, uh, the vote, excuse me. everything. Maxine, it's on the amendment to return it back to CAC. Thank I you understand. so much. understand. It needs to go back because there's important information missing. You're not told how old the building is. As I recall, it's not very old. And you're not told how many people use it. And you're told that staff was asked to, to base their recommendations on two members of the club who presented their plans to them. And we've learned through the years uh, in GRF that when we ask the clubs to drive the renovation of something, we're inviting them to dream. It's not really their fault, you know, but when you ask for that, you get wants, not needs. And I'm, tr I, I'm trying, there's no date here, I'm trying to remember when uh, the new tennis courts were constructed, I think maybe 15 years ago, maybe a little <coughs> further back than that. And at this, I don't know whether that clubhouse was built at the same time or earlier. Uh, I can't believe it's old enough to be falling apart. It's not. It sounds like it needs remodeling, not renovation. And when I look here at all these things, uh, toilets, urinals, sinks, garbage disposal, why are they being replaced before they wear out? Our policy is usually to replace those things when they're being worn out. You know, we're not building a new building, and that seems like very unnecessary costs. And uh, this full restroom renovation, the toilets, the urinals, they all wore out already? I doubt it. This is uh, not driven by, really, by staff. And I think if it goes back to committee, the committee can ask for an RFP. They can ask for a request for proposal from staff based on needs, based on needs. Um, it says here, staff was directed to bring the estimated costs for the scope of work provided by the club president. <coughs> so it should be the other way around. The club presidents of all the clubs should always be invited to add in their comments and their, their uh, uh, vision of needs, but it should not be based on <coughs> wants. Um, Let's see. Let's see. Have, have the repairs, also the repair plan, the repair, what would you say, <coughs> history there. Had the repairs on all these uh, toilets and sinks and so forth suddenly increased? <coughs> Maybe they have, you know, but we have no report on that. You really need a very thorough report. I'm so glad you're considering sending it back to committee. I think that's a very wise decision and that um, while you're at it, if you have to replace some toilets, they should be higher ones. They shouldn't be so low to the floor anymore. <laughs> in there too. Keep in mind the status of the community. Maybe you're already doing that. I know you've put uh, grip rails in here in this building, which is wonderful. Anybody, even at age 55, who's had a knee replacement appreciates those grip rails. The grip rails are in the building. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Our all next, right, is there any, all right, Bert? Our next speaker. I, I just but want to comment that Bert one of the reasons that were given for expanding the patio had to do with their desire to have barbecues and uh, parties. They're 30 feet from Clubhouse 7 and the patio of Clubhouse 7. This is off so topic. It's okay. not a need because they all can right, walk 30 Bert, feet. I'm sorry, we have to get back on topic. It's off topic, but thank you. Okay. Okay, next person out there, Cheryl. Is Rhina Rothberg. Okay, Rhina. This is on the topic. And Ryan, I know you're going to speak on topic, right? I definitely think it should go back to committee. When it oh, was presented to MNC, and Jim can correct me, there was the original appropriation. Then there was the second 10, request for a want, not a need, to have the patio made larger to have an overhang. And when I asked her, would the club be willing to pay anything towards that? Oh, definitely not. And then the third element was for air conditioning. And she, from her seat, said, well, the air conditioning isn't necessary. Now, Carl and I voted against this because we thought the original which had to do with making the facility ADA compliant. And that's why the restrooms are in there. 
And also, when it comes to the restrooms, why can't we have the, whatever they call it, if you go to every place now, and it's a single restroom for either. So you only need one to make it compliant. Unisex. So I am in favor of sending it back to committee. Thank you. Thank you. All right, anyone else out there? OK. Then um, the. All in, favor of it back. All in favor of sending this back to CAC, please rate. Oh, we're gonna, are we going to do it on voting in progress on the tablet then, correct? CAC or MNC? No, CAC. They wanted to send it to CAC. It went to MNC already. Two. I'm sorry, not back. I apologize. My error. Sending it to CAC. I think you said to committee. Back to committee. Really say to committee, right? Could mean both. It, yeah. We can do both. All right, so I can get to vote here. Uh, okay. Yes, for me. And then, and then you vote on it again. Do we? Okay, we vote on it again? No, it's going, no, back, it's going back to committee. Oh, you don't have to vote on the amendment and then vote on the... Okay. No. No, you don't. No. Okay. All right. The uh, motion passes. All right, let's see. The next thing would be entertain a motion to introduce a collection policy for broadband services. Okay. July would be the initial notification. All right, Joan, are you going to read it? Yes. Please, thank you so much. I'm just going to read the changes so you're aware. Uh, this is resolution 90 19 X collection policy for broadband services. In the first paragraph, when members are delinquent in payment of their premium channel and or equipment rental charges, send notices in compliances with the FCC regulations, inclusive of a late fee, and take action to suspend such members' premium channel service. That was the first edition. In the second, whereas, third line, fourth line down, it says uh, notice Let's see. Automatically send notices which notices shall comply with FCC regulations inclusive of a $10 late fee subsequent to each 30 days of delinquency. In other words, it's a $10 late fee for every month of delinquency. And to suspend premium channel services to members who have been delinquent for at least 60 days without the need of any further board approval. So at 60 days, their services would be suspended, but they would be charged after 30 days. And then a complete paragraph is added, whereas the board of directors of this corporation has considered and discussed this procedure and has determined that it is in the best interests of this corporation and its members for its agent to charge lessees an equipment rental deposit prior to issuance of equipment an amount consistent with the then current fee schedule. And then since we are going to be reading it next month for the final vote, it says now therefore be it resolved August 6, 2019, that the agent acting through the, its broadband division effect a policy whereby for any members who are at least should be 60 days delinquent in payment of their premium channel charges. That notice is sent out in compliance with FCC regulations would suspend premium channel service until such time as the members have paid any outstanding delinquent amounts. And finally, in the next paragraph, resolve further that the agent is hereby authorized and directed to take all such action and this is added, assess all such late fees and send all such notices as they deem necessary and so on. That 
That's it. Turn the page. There were no further additions to this. The uh, the motion I, I move to approve this these additions and this motion for discussion purposes, and postpone the final vote till next month in compliance with Civil Code 4360. All right. Do I have a second? I second. All right, Ray. Thank you. All right. Any discussion, Judith? Hey, for those of you at home that don't have a copy of this, the reason we're doing this for several reasons. When someone isn't paying um, their rental charges for uh, equipment, it by the time it gets to us, sometimes it's six months later, and by then the fees have added up and added up and added up. And then they come to the hearing and say, well, this is ridiculous. How did the fees get so high? And because we have to follow well 30 days and give them notice this and give time for them to respond and yada, yada, yada. This way, if we start imposing the fees right away and it's automatic and it doesn't have to come to hearing first, then number one, it gives the person incentive to pay the bill. And number two, it'll keep the fees from getting so out of hand that they won't have to come to a hearing, take our time, and we won't be writing off fees because someone didn't understand the process. So I'll be uh, in favor of these changes. Any more discussion? All right. Anybody out in the audience? Okay, I think it's time to vote then. Would everybody please go to your tablet? Thank you. Are you okay? Yes, for me. All right, the motion passes. And next, we're going to move on to entertain a motion to approve supplemental appropriation and award a contract for Clubhouse 4 pool deck rebuild. Resolution 90-19XX, contract award and supplemental funding for Clubhouse 4 upper deck rebuild. Whereas the 2018 capital plan included a $62,000 appropriation to replace and recoat the upper pool deck surface located above the old bridge room at Clubhouse 4. And whereas during an initial site visit to inspect the upper pool deck, staff discovered signs of significant moisture intrusion next to structural roof beams. And whereas the source of the water intrusion is runoff from the roof pool deck combined with water entering into the building at the concrete pool deck's intersection with the CMU wall. In addition, water is seeping through the CMU wall below the pool deck, and whereas the current capital improvement allocation of $62,000 will not sufficiently fund the proposed product scope of work to replace and requote the clubhouse for upper pool deck surface, as well as the remediation of seeping water through the CMU wall below the pool deck, and requires a supplemental appropriation to fully fund the increased scope of work for this capital improvement project. Now, therefore, be it resolved in July 2nd, 2019, the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby awards a contract to be foster construction in the amount of $243,102, sorry, $243,102 to replace and resurface the clubhouse for upper deck, upper pool deck, and to waterproof the exterior wall adjacent to the pool to prevent further moisture intrusion damage to the enclosed space below the pool deck and approve a supplemental appropriation in the amount of $187, sorry, $187,342 to fully fund the project for completion in 2019. And resolve further that the officers and agents, not against, agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the Golden Rain Foundation Corporation to carry out this resolution. I move we accept this resolution. Second. All right. <clears throat> Cheryl, you have the second? Okay. Any any discussion on this? Bert? Yeah, I 
will not support this proposal as written. Um, I, I don't see any numbers with regard to how many people use that upper sun deck. Every time I have been there, I have never seen anybody. And given our age and given what the sun means to us when it hits us, it's not perhaps a very good idea to even have that. So we're, we already had appropriated $62,000 to recoat the upper deck, and I'm saying why? Okay, I, I personally agree that we have to do something with regard to the water intrusion problem. And I would agree to the first expenditure. Uh, but I would not agree to the $62,000. All right, thank you. And then Joan, you'll be next, and then Jim. As far as I understand, this is an emergency situation of water intrusion, and the longer we wait, the worse it's going to be, and it requires this amount of money to fix it. Okay, Jim, and then we'll have Judith, and then we'll have um, Pat. Yeah, it's not um, very much uh, concerned with the people that want to um, be up on top there, but the situation is there's a, a huge room down below, about 50 by 100, 200 feet, and that needs, uh, staff has about three different areas they'd like to put in that area, in that down below. So it's a matter of fixing up an existing facility. It's not to, to anything about people getting a suntan up on top. I personally am not arguing that Excuse issue. Excuse me. Oh. All, right. We're, all right, just one second. Now, now we've got to go to Judith. Are you done? Yes. Okay, now Judith, then Pat, and then back to Bert. I think uh, he answered my question. I wanted to know if that enclosed area was the old bridge room. We used to, it used to be the old bridge room, and we've been storing things in there now for years that have gotten damaged because of the water intrusion. And it's musty in there, and it's unsafe, and it's, it's a great piece of real estate, and it does need to be, uh, we do need to do this work because so we can use that room for better things. And so uh, you answered my question. So I'm going to be in favor of this because it needs to be done, if anything, so we could use that piece of real estate. Thank you. Okay. All right, Pat. Yeah, in all the years that I have um, used Pool 4, uh, I have never seen anyone up there either. Uh, however, I do think that this is like, Joan said an emergency fix, and we need to fix it. Otherwise, we're likely to be in for a lot more problems. I would like to see some kind of figures about how much money we could generate from the use of this room that we can't use right now. The rental. rental, yeah. Thank you. All right, and then anyone else here before we go back to Bert? All right, Diane, and then back to Bert, because Bert's already spoken once on this. Go ahead. I was just going to say I, uh, I'll vote in favor of this as well. That, of this as well, and I, I, I mean, maybe Ernesto can address it, but I do think that the reason we're stealing off the sun deck is so that the water doesn't leak below. Okay, and then anyone else here? All right, Bert, back to you. I think uh, I made it myself clear. We should not be spending the $62,000 to put a sun deck. Okay, I agreed with the expenditure with regard to the water intrusion. I think that that has to be done. So in essence, I'm saying we should be approving uh, the supplemental appropriation of $187,000, but we should rescind the $62,000 for the sunroof. All right. Um, okay, Don? Yeah, in all due respect to Bert, in, I'm sorry, I had this off. In all due respect to Bert, in order to repair the room below, you have to repair the sun deck. You have no choice. Okay. Um, Ernesto, we are so glad you're here. <laughs> Would you please give us a few of your comments? Thank you. Yeah, Don, it's absolutely correct. They're not mutually exclusive. Uh, if you're going to fix the issues of the moisture intrusion downstairs, you also need to repair that deck. The deck has already outlived its, its uh, useful life, and it's causing a moisture to in, be introduced into the room below, which is right into the rafters of that room. Mm -hmm. so. So you can't mutually exclude, exclude uh, one from the other. Okay, I think you kind of mentioned that in your staff report, in the, in the report. Thank you. Anything else? All right, anybody else would like to yay or nay against this? Okay, I think it's time to vote then. Oh, oh is there any other discussion out in the audience? No other speakers? Thank you.
Where did you use uh, that thing? Yeah, this one. That's just the light. Did. Just the light. No, no, not hard. Just light. Do it light. He doesn't like him. <laughs> Come on, let's see if he can do it. No. Okay, you're gonna. He's gonna vote yes. All right. So, we're good. The motion passes. <coughs> All right. Let's see where we are now. Um, now we're to the uh, getting to the committee reports, and the entire committee report can be found online, as it's noted there. When you go to lagunawoodsvillage.com, you'll go to residents, and then forward slash to the Golden Rain Foundation. You'll click on documents, and you can find the reports at those listed there. First, we'll have the report of the Finance Committee, Financial Reports, Director Phelps. Okay, uh, before I go into the details of the May financials, I'll start off again this month with information about GRF finances. GRF's net operating costs for 2019 are $28 million. The question for today is, where does GRF spend all that money? Many people have the misperception that the Recreation Department spends all of GRF's money <clears throat> uh, in, to manage the recreation facilities. In fact, GRF pays all of the costs of the Recreation Department, but it only represents 19% or just over $5 million of GRF, GRF's operating costs. So where's the rest of the money spent? You may not realize it, but GRF also pays almost all of the costs of the following departments. Broadband services, which includes the cable TV operations and Channel 6, now known, I think, as Village Television. Uh, security and social services, including operating the gates and security officers, uh, human resources, information services, our IT department, and general services, which includes operating the bus system, the community center, GRF janitorial services, maintenance of GRF streets and sidewalks, and maintenance of all vehicles. These five de departments account for 54% of GRF's operating costs. GRF also pays its share of costs incurred in the following departments. Landscape services, which maintains GRF grounds other than the golf courses, which are included in recreation. Financial services, which also includes the cost of insurance and mailroom services. The office of the CEO and admin staff. Resident services and maintenance and construction, which includes some repair and maintenance of GRF facilities but the bulk of GRF's maintenance and construction projects are performed by outside contractors. The contracts are administered by VMS staff and paid for out of GRF's reserves. So these five departments represent 27% of our operating costs. So in summary, 54% of GRF's expenses um, are for other services paid almost for services paid almost exclusively by GRF, such as broadband security, human resources, IT, and general services. Twenty-seven percent are for our share of the five other departments, and it's nineteen percent of our annual operating costs that pay for the recreation costs. So, for nineteen percent of our of our budget. We, um, let's see, we operate the golf courses, clubhouses, village greens, performing arts center, fitness centers, garden centers, equestrian centers, pools, library, pickleball courts, shuffleboard courts, lawn bowling, tennis courts, archery, table tennis, billiards, um, and again, it also includes maintaining and landscaping of our golf courses. So, um, and when we get to slide 10, I'll address how GRF spends its reserves. So now if we could, if I would, I'd, I'll cue the slides. And we'll get on with the review of GRF's May 31st, 2019 preliminary financial statements. Through the reporting period ended May 31st, 2019, total revenue for GRF from all sources was $18.2 million, and total expenses were $17 million, resulting in net revenue of just over a million. Thanks. In finance, we keep a close eye on the operating portion of our financial result, results. As you can see on this slide, 
The operating fund without depreciation shows an operating surplus of just over $100,000. And I will mention that this is a revised slide because the first one that went out was, so if you have one that, that shows anything different than $111,000, um, it's an old slide. It had a mistake on it. Slide three. This chart shows the same figures of the income statement from slide one, but adds a column to compare them to budget. You can see on this slide that our non-assessment revenue was $368,000 less than we projected. It was offset by a savings in total expenses of $279,000, leaving us a variance of only $89,000 worth in budget. So it's, I, there's comments out there that GRF is losing a lot of money. I don't know what that's coming from. GRF at this point is only $89,000 worth in budget, which isn't bad um, considering the size of our budget. Uh, slide four. This slide shows our most significant variances by category with green bars representing favorable variances and orange bars representing unfavorable items. We had less revenue than expected. Um, the trust facilities fees were $191,000. Um, it had an unfavorable variance due to fewer manors sold. <coughs> Golf operations was $184,000 unfavorable due to rain. And, but on the other hand, we had $160,000 more in interest income than budgeted, which helps to offset some of the shortfall in the trust facilities fees. Time, we have, uh, pro we have uh, variances due to timing. Um, this is because budgets are spread evenly throughout the year, but certain expenditures occur later in the year. So we have favorable, favorable variances that are only temporary. And those are, um, you can see those are repairs and maintenance as well as materials and supplies. And then there are things that we, th we hope are actual savings um, that will, will continue through the year. Uh, some variances um, are operational. So those would be uh, utilities where we are $69,000 in savings due to less usage of irrigation water because of the rain. And then employee compensation is down $49,000 due to less participation in medical and retirement benefits. The next slide, um, expenses to date of $17 million, excluding depreciation, are shown on this pie chart with our largest categories being compensation, cable TV, <coughs> utilities, insurance, and so on. The ratio of these expenses changes as work is performed throughout the year. And the next slide, we have resources, we have sources of revenue other than monthly assessments, such as fees and rentals, that we refer to as non-assessment revenues. To date, we have received almost $5.3 million. Broadband services generated the most revenue, followed by the trust facilities fees, golf, golf operations, and so forth. The non-assessment revenue helps keep down our assessments. Slide seven. This slide shows resale history from 2017 to 2019. Community-wide sales this year totaled 295. That was through May 31st. Most of these transactions generate the $5,000 trust facilities fee, which is the primary source of revenue for our reserves. Um, and as I said earlier, the figures I have is that overall the sales in the village are down 14%, which is slightly better than the countywide decline for the same period uh, down to six, that was 16%. And if you look to slide eight, starting with the first column on the left, the funds show a combined balance of $29.2 million. Included in this total are contributions received this year through assessments, trust facilities, fees, and interest earnings. The second column shows work in progress of $5.4 million, reflecting the amounts paid for projects that are not yet complete. The third column shows the net of the first two. The net, uh, these are adjusted fund balances, are $23.7 million. And slide nine. Here we compare our current year balances to historical fund balances for the past five years. GRF has averaged about $23 million in reserve contingency funds over the last five years. Um, so that's why I was confused when I think I heard Cash say we had $70, $70 million. So maybe he's said a different figure, but. Uh, and then now for slide 10. This slide shows that, that $23 million has been appropriated by the board for various projects and equipment purchases, and that the remaining encumbrances against our reserve and contingency funds is $15 million. The list on this 
slide gives you an idea where our reserve funds are committed. If you were to add up the appropriations for recreation facilities, so this would be like aquatics, fitness, the clubhouses, garden centers, golf facilities, and pickleball courts, you'll see this is 37% or just over one third of our reserve appropriations. These aren't, again, these aren't annual costs. These are repairs or maintenance that will last a number of years or in most cases, many years. The other 63% or just under two thirds of GRF's reserve funds are committed to projects or items you may not know are paid for by GRF. And that again is such as broadband computers, community, this community center, paving, security, and again, all the vehicles. GRF is the entity that buys all vehicles owned by the village, whether they are used by security, maintenance, landscape, or by transportation for the bus service services. GRF pays for all durable equipment used in the village, whether used by maintenance or landscape. This is one of GRF's roles. All vehicles and durable equipment used by the United and Third Housing Mutuals is paid out of GRF's reserve funds. Um, that's it for the slides, but I remind you that more detail is provided in the GRF Finance Committee meeting agenda packets, which are available online and at GRF Finance Committee meetings. Our next meeting will be on Wednesday, August 21st at 1.30 p.m. in the boardroom. I have a couple other meetings to mention. The first is on July 8th, we have a, which I think is this Monday. We have a GRF Business Planning Committee meeting. It follows the All Boards 2020 budget meeting that's at 1.30 in the boardroom. On July the 10th at 9.30 in the morning in the boardroom, we'll review the first vision version Vision, version of our 2020 budget. And the last meeting I want to tell you about is on July 17th at 1.30 in the boardroom. We will be brainstorming ideas for how we might change our cost sharing model and ideas of other sources of revenue for GRF to explore. We will not be discussing the merits of the ideas or making decisions at this meetings. meeting. We are just brainstorming and recording the ideas. <coughs> if you have an idea, please bring it to, a, to the meeting. You are also welcome, if you prefer, you can send it to me uh, via email at diane.phelps at lagunawoodsvillage.com. Um, and you can, yeah, I don't want to spell out my name, but uh, you can get it at the, the front desk if you need it. Um, and all ideals will be considered. Nothing is sacred, forbidden, or off the table. And I'm sorry I took so long, but that's my report. Diane, thank you for that excellent report. You always give us so much information. When is the brainstorming on chair? July the 17th. 130, is it? At 1.30. Thank you. And it'll be here in the boardroom. Okay. The next report will be from Community Activities Committee, of which I'm chair. And I just want to say that there was no June meeting. The next meeting will be held in the boardroom on Thursday, July 11th. So that's coming up pretty soon at 1.30. GRF President Dr. Beth Perrick will chair the meeting as I will be unavailable for that particular meeting. Okay, that's my report. And after that, let's go to Report of the Landscape Committee. And that would be Bert Malda. As you know from the last meeting, uh, we voted to go quarterly reports. Um, and the Landscape Committee therefore did not meet and will not meet uh, for another few months yet. So I'll be back next month and give you the exact date and time. It's, it, so it's, it won't be meeting on August the 14th? It'll be meeting on another date? Um, let's see, we already to August the 14th. Because it met in May. <coughs> Excuse me. So that would be quarterly. Um, how'd you, oh, I'm sorry. That's no, okay. it will be meeting on August the 14th. All right, at 1.30 p.m. Yes. here in the boardroom. Okay, thank hopefully, you. Hopefully, hopefully. Okay. Next, we'll have a report of the Maintenance and Construction Committee, Director Matson. Okay. <clears throat> On our MNC um, committee, we have a project log that is now showing 26 items that uh, staff is uh, working on, and I'd like to report on some of that. One of them 
is that everyone uh, is aware of very clearly is called Gate Security Project. And the Gate Security Project is on its last phase and ahead of schedule. Gates 4, 10, 14 are now under construction, which we began on June the 24th and are scheduled to reopen August the 5th. Gate 4 is providing pedestrian access only 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Alternate gates for gate four are gates one and two, which are open 24 seven and gate three, which is open 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. Gate 10 is providing pedestrian and golf cart access only from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. Alternate to gate 10 are gates um, seven, eight, and nine, which are open 24 seven. Gate 14 is being kept in full operation during construction with pedestrian, golf, and vehicle traffic access 24-7. <clears throat> and also during our meeting, we uh, talked a, a lot about uh, the tennis building, which just got sent back to uh, um, the committee. And, uh, but uh, we spent quite a bit of time on on that, and we we did have a uh, four-two vote to approve the, uh, the the situation that we just sent back to committee. Also, um, Clubhouse Six is this month. We'll have the HVAC replaced. And also, um, recently, for this building, the HVAC was replaced, and it's now in a uh, commissioning process, and by the end of July, it should be in full operation. And that's about all I can say for MNC. The next meeting will be August the 14th. Also, for the PAC, um, have a little report on that. The contract was awarded to SVA Architects to begin the preparation of the construction documents for the maintenance and equipment safety upgrades. The 90% drawings and material boards are currently under review and a presentation will be made at the August PAC task force meeting. Now, when it says the 90% um, the drawing, the drawings and material boards are currently under review, that under review is occurring here by staff. <clears throat> On the Energy um, Committee, the GRF's energy consultant, the Energy Coalition, will be making a presentation on a microgrid power solution for the electrical loads generated by Clubhouse 7, the Clubhouse 7 parking lot, and the community center. This presentation will be provided July the 3rd, that's tomorrow when we have our meeting during the Village Energy Task Force meeting right here in the boardroom at at uh, 1.30 tomorrow. And that's the end of my presentation. All right, thank you. Next, we'll have the report of the Media and Communications Committee. Director Millman. Good report. Meeting communications met Monday, June 17th, here at the boardroom. I have just two or three things I want to report. some of which we've already dealt with here in the meeting. Uh, the collection policy for broadband services was uh, updated and changed, which we have voted on and approved. Um, the proposed fees for broadband regarding the installation fees and remote controls and equipment replacement was, was also presented in the notes. I hope you'll read that. Um, Finally, uh, Chuck, so Chuck Holland presented all of the, uh, uh, the the financials for the broadband services. Uh, 
And Eileen, Eileen Pollan gave us a, a report on communications. And our communications list grows daily. As you saw, we have many, uh, e many newsletters and various notifications, including all of the e-blasts that we receive every week, the, uh, the breeze, and various publications, all of the, uh, all of the um, flyers that they put out and everything. Okay, that's pretty much my report. Our next meeting is going to be Monday, July 15th at 1.30 here in the boardroom. Come for entertainment and communication. Thank you. All right, now um, the report of the Thrive Task Force. Director Millman. Yes, the Thrive Task Force has already presented their most current project, the Centenarian Project, which you have, may have witnessed here in the boardroom, but you'll have another opportunity to see in action at the July 4th celebration, where we'll show the centenarian photographs that were taken by our, our staff, um, and uh, they're very impressive. Age, whatever, maybe uh, 20, <laughs> and age 100 plus, and they're very exciting. Also, on uh, this a presentation on, on on Thursday. Inside of Clubhouse 2 will be some of the interviews that were given by these folks, and you'll be able to hear them uh, speak. So if you just come in for a little rest, you'll be able to hear them on, online. <laughs> uh, our next project is going to be revealed in September. Thank you. All right, and before we get to uh, Ray Gross, I just wanted to say concerning the... Uh, Centenarian project. It was here held in the boardroom last Friday. It was wonderful. It's also up on the YouTube channel. And to hear some of those people and their interviews and what world was like when they were growing up was just, it was wonderful. It was, I was just so glad I was in attendance. All right, Ray, now we're on to you. Uh, the mobility uh, uh, committee met on uh, June the 5th, and our next meeting will be August the 7th. I have quite a little bit of information here. Um, we, we have new 18-passenger bus, and it was recently delivered. Staff is now presently installing the radio, the cameras, and the bus will be put in service around July the 5th. The new bus will be used for the regular bu fixed bus system. A second new bus will be delivered the second half of July and put into service the 1st of August. Staff is evaluating the draft fixed route changes as recommended by a consultant, Fair and Paris, as well as all the information provided to us by uh, uh, the regular folks that attended the meeting. Annette had a situation where she wanted to consider how can we help uh, mobile people with, with buses or what other situations do we have. So she went and got a, a copy from the city of Laguna Hills for senior dial-a-ride program. However, I showed her a beautiful picture of my face uh, where it says City of Laguna Woods Taxi Voucher ID. And this is the information. It's very informative. We haven't met the City Hall. Uh, this is in the event of emergency situations. Just to give you an idea, quick idea. You can get $100 worth of taxi bucks for $70. And there's all kind of information on here as to do it. This would be used in an emergency factor so that, like you, Annette was saying, she wanted to make sure our people had a methodology, a way to get to a hospital in an emergency situation or something, other than if we can't get a bus a service to them immediately. So uh, all in all, that's good. I've got some copies here if anybody's interested, uh, several copies here. Uh, like I said, the next meeting will be August the 7th. So now I'll be reporting on the Laguna Canyon Foundation we have at the front desk a lot of these copies uh, giving you all kind of information regarding fitness hikes, keep it wild, family hikes, so forth and so on. The, the canyon would appreciate it, however, if you would make online reservations, uh, and that would be done by you signing up at lagunacanyon.org slash events. They want to make sure that you also have water with you and other items that you may need in the event of an emergency. So just be prepared. Thank you.
Report of the Security and Community Access. Oh, I apologize. Report of the Security and Community Access Committee. Director Tibbetts. Thank you. <clears throat> As mentioned, the uh, gate arms <clears throat> are uh, stopping a lot of, of uh, people who are just going through. It, it's really cut back. As Maxine said earlier this morning, the, all the arms in United have been uh, uh, put in, and it's really been a great success, working really nice. Uh, <clears throat> it was reported that the, some coin boxes in United have been broken into in the same area. We aren't sure who it is yet, but we are going to uh, uh, improve the boxes and the... And, uh, the box covers to make it harder to get into and maybe even change the money from from quarters to coins that have no value. We aren't sure yet. That would be up to United. And uh, we had one major incident, uh, and I'd like to commend one of our officers, uh, and I hope I pronounce his name correctly. It's Ayman Movasagi. I'm not sure how close that is. But he uh, found a man quite high on drugs hiding out in one of our mail rooms and uh, non-resident. And uh, he cre requested backup and the guy was quite belligerent and uh, uncooperative. So we called the sheriff's department and the man was arrested. Still not sure how he got in. Uh, <clears throat> Major calls to security year to date is the major major call is 330 calls uh, dealing with falls. And major traffic violation to date is uh, no decal on golf carts. That is slowly going down because of all the stops people are now getting the golf carts uh, registered, which means they've got to pay their way with uh, using our electricity. In crime, the number one petty theft, still uh, bicycles. Lock them if you know, you're going to lose them. And in compliance, the uh, number one uh, uh, illegal op uh, is illegal occupancy followed by carport clutter. And another compliance issue that's starting to get bigger now is unauthorized alterations in your unit. And if they're not done properly, many times it'll just create problems. And it's so easy to follow the procedure. You just go across the hall and, and, and those people will help you and they'll walk you through it and it will save a lot of, a lot of problems. And at this time, I'd uh, ask uh, Director Ray Gross to report on traffic committee. Uh, yeah, we met on uh, June the 19th, and it's, it's very interesting on, on what comes about. We have, for instance, we have two parking on sidewalks, and people get all upset when we notice them about that. And I've said this before, when you park on a sidewalk, people in wheelchairs and so forth and so on cannot get by. It's imperative that you don't park on those sidewalks. They have to go out into the street, and then they can get hurt by the cars going by. We had uh, five no valid GRF decals. We had uh, two um, ex expired registrations. People, a lot of people, again, believe it or not, say, oh, I live here, and I don't go outside, so why should I get, you know, uh, get my uh, new, new license things? It's mandatory, you have to have it, especially for the insurance factors. We only had one stop sign. We had uh, two commercial vehicles. What we mean by that is that commercial vehicles are parking in here illegally. We've made arrangements to have them parked in the RV section. We've given them a spot <coughs> over there uh, because of the rules and regulations established. No driver's license produced. Now that's interesting. There are several reasons for that. If a vehicle is parked in the garage, for instance, and they get a notice of violation, naturally the person's not there, so you can't produce the driver's license. Also, other people who are being followed by the security and they leave the area, they go outside the gates, we can't get, the, get their license, so they take a picture of their driver's, uh, the, the vehicle license plate and the picture of the person. Then when they come in, I ask to see their driver's license. 
And again, that is the reason for insurance factors. Um, we had uh, obstructing uh, access to the location. Uh, we had one, which means that you actually parked in a situation where people couldn't get in or out with vehicles and so forth. And uh, we had uh, uh, 11, uh, 11 to, to 16 miles per hour over. We had two of those. In addition, we have five letters from people who cannot come to the a traffic hearing, so they send the letter saying, please excuse me, or this, that, and the other. And with those letters, you had uh, five no decals, one commercial vehicle, um, and one in no parking zone again, and again, two required expired license. So it's imperative that we have to act on those as well. So the security people put up the pictures of the situation, we can then evaluate it. So as I stated before, the next meeting, will be on July the 17th. Thank you. Okay, next will be Judy Troutman. We'll, I'm sorry. Judy Troutman will report <clears throat> on disaster preparedness. Okay, we did not have a meeting in June because we only meet on odd months, the last Tuesday of the odd month, 9.30, here in the boardroom. Um, you will not find a complete copy of this report online because we didn't meet in June, so I don't have the formal report. There will be one next month. However, uh, I want to talk a little bit. Uh, in the next two, three months, we're going to be addressing the task force um, resolution, which is our charter. I think the energy has, uh, we have several task forces here in the village, uh, an audit task force, energy task force, Thrive task force, and um, DPTF, which is the Disaster Task Force. And I'm going to encourage all of you, I hope you're writing this down, um, to read in advance before we get to that discussion in a couple of months. Uh, go online to Residents, hit govern, Governing Boards, and then scroll down to Documents, go to the GRF logo and hit on that. Then you go to Documents again and you'll hit Resolution and you want to go under resolutions for 2018 and hit the resolution um, for August 7th, 2018, and it's resolution 19-18-32, and that's the resolution for the Energy Task Force. And the first part says, um, Disaster Preparedness Task Force was established on February 4th, 1992, pursuant to Article Six, section one of our bylaws of this corporation. That's one issue we're going to be addressing, uh, how our task forces comply with our bylaws. And uh, the other thing of interest is we meet regularly, which is every other month now, where the chief of security will act as chair. So that's another thing where we have to uh, work on. So be prepared, if this kind of thing interests you, to come to the meetings in September, October, um, Go ahead and download and read these uh, resolutions that have to do with any task force charter so you'll be prepared for that meeting. Um, oh, I want to clarify something from the buses. If you fall outside the bus while you're waiting to get on the bus or have an emergency, the bus drivers cannot pick you up and bring you to the hospital on the bus. So don't ask them to do that. Don't expect them to do that. They'll get in trouble and lose their job if they do that. They cannot do that. So I just wanted to clarify that. But other than that, they're very helpful, yeah. folks. Um, I just want to go over the schedule. The next, uh, we are having a class on a Saturday in July at 10 AM. And I'm still waiting to hear exactly which Saturday that is. It may be this Saturday or any of the other Saturdays in July for the new good neighbor captain training, because a lot of people work and they needed to go to a Saturday class because most of them are during the week. Uh, the next basic first aid training is going to be Monday, September 16th, between 1 and 4 at Clubhouse 7. That's basic first aid training. And on Wednesday, October 16th, from 1 to 3, will be good neighbor captain training again between 1 and 3, Clubhouse 7. And on Monday the 21st, October 21st, between 1 and 4 will be the adult CPR AED training again at Clubhouse 7. 
Um, if you need more you can, uh, information on training schedule, you can go to the office, the Disaster Preparedness Office, which is in this building and the far northeast corner of the building. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. That completes our reports. The next meeting for uh, security is August 26th at 1.30 in this room. Thank you. All right, and let's see. There is uh, no future agenda items. There's being, there being no further business, I, I would like to thank the board and the community for their input. This meeting is recessed. Comments. Pardon? Comments. Okay. Oh, I apologize. Comments. All right. We'll start with Pat. Pat, may we have comments? Uh, I just have to say that I'm very disappointed we haven't tackled the issue of the bylaws yet. It's very important. As it sits right now, we are violating our bylaws uh, with our task forces because they're not in compliance. Thank you. You're welcome. Judith. Um, I was just informed they decided on the 13th, Saturday the 13th, between 10 and 12 for the good neighbor captain training for those that can't go during the week. Thank you. Thank you Happy, for happy 4th of July. <laughs> All right. Ray Gross. Good meeting. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And Bert. Okay. Don. I have nothing. All right. Diane. Good meeting. Thank you. Okay. Joan. Happy 4th of July. Good Thank meeting. you. Dick? Uh, my only comment is I'm glad the sun is out now. <laughs> <laughs> totally. All right, Siobhan. Okay. All right, Jeff. Cheryl. Okay. And basically, um, I would like to thank the board and the community for their input. This meeting is recessed for lunch and will reconvene to close session.